Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm actually uh, teaching out of my uh, uh, office today, my department office. Um, and uh, so things are set up a little bit differently today. So if you have any problems uh, hearing me or seeing me today, let me know or seeing the, the slides or anything like that. Uh, okay, uh, let's uh, set some things up here. So I will share my screen and hopefully that will not be a problem. Yes, there we go. Okay, hopefully you are seeing uh, the screen and you are seeing me. Uh, okay, hold on, a couple of other things here. Do, 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 do. Okay. I think we're okay. I'm only using one screen. I usually use two screens too, so I can't see you, but I can, I'll can. certainly be able to hear you. And uh, and if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat as well. But um, let's start talking about this exam, which you can take if you're excited about taking it. You can take it at midnight tonight. Um, anytime between midnight tonight and midnight on Sunday, uh, you have 90 minutes to take the exam. Um, and so it will be timed. Um, make sure that you've gotten all your bathroom uh, uh, rests and all that stuff done before you start up because the clock continues to count even if you take a little break. Um, uh, open book, as you know, uh, you know, anything you want to use is fine. Um, but importantly, you must take it alone, okay? Um, you must take it, uh, you know, without the help of anybody else in the class. Okay, uh, the material you should know, it covers everything through, actually, it'll probably, we'll probably be uh, done with the, the midterm material about halfway through today. We're just going to finish taste. We've just got another three slides or so, um, and then we'll start up with touch. But touch will be um, on the uh, final exam, not uh, uh, this weekend's exam. Um, everything through taste. So that means everything through chapter five, including the preface. Don't forget the preface. Um, there will be a couple of questions taken directly from there. Uh, and then I made a mistake. Your discussion section material that will be um, tested on this exam will be through last Wednesday, and I believe that's the ninth. So not yesterday. Yesterday you went through touch, um, and that will be tested on the final exam so we can keep all the touch information together on the final exam. So uh, everything through taste, everything from the very beginning of the book, including the preface through chapter five, all the lecture uh, material that um, corresponds to that and all the discussion section material that corresponds to that as well. Remember, there is discussion section material um, that I did not cover in the lecture and it is not covered in the book. So it's important that you review that there are I think we have six questions or seven questions on the exam directly from uh, discussion section material, um, at least. Maybe it's more than eight or nine. And uh, then there's a, a number of questions that are from the book um, that are not covered in either discussion or lecture. The majority of questions are from lecture, but it's important that you use those other sources as well. Um, you know, I, since I had to drive in early this morning from LA, I did not get a chance to post those sample questions. I will do so right after class today while I'm eating my lunch. Um, but again, they're not a study guide. Those questions there will be four or five questions that will just give you a sense of, uh, of the style of questions that we asked for the exam. And that's, you know, as I've said many times, um, uh, you know, you'll have a choice of all of the above sometimes, none of the above. Um, or both A and B are correct, or, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, that's just, to, so I'll post some questions, but it's just to give you a sense of what the format is like. All right, we're uh, lecturing from England today, as you can see. It's a beautiful day there. Cool. Uh, all right, any questions about the exam? Go ahead and, and uh, put them in the chat, or feel free to pipe up, and I'd be happy to answer them. Nothing. Uh, everything's working, right? So just in the somebody in the chat just say yes, everything's working. If everything's working, okay. Yes, good. Okay, so you can see the uh, slides and you can see me. 
Um, and we can uh, continue on our discussion if there's no questions about the exam. Uh, so uh, you'll all be done with the exam by the time I see you next Tuesday. Um, and hopefully you'll do well. All right, terrific. Then let's continue our discussion. Um, we um, so let's let's get our big picture here on um, on taste. Remember, one thing we said about taste is that interestingly, it's our probably our multi our most multi sensory taste uh, sense. All right, so let me say that again. Taste out of all the senses that we're studying is probably our most multi sensory sense. And what I mean by that is without the influences of smell, especially, but as well as sight and hearing and touch, our experience of taste would not be very vivid at all. We really wouldn't have a very uh, a complex uh, uh, sense of taste. Um, and, you know, we have, a, uh, you know, some intuitions about that, certainly, uh, if we lose our sense of smell a little bit because of a cold or COVID, um, you know, things taste very, very bland. But there's other situations where food can taste bland, and even if we have a good sense of taste, and that's, that's a good sense of smell, and that would be um, if we're not able to see our food. And, uh, you know, of course, we use the example of the dark restaurant for that, but then there's also these very um, well-known examples where if people are blindfolded um, and then are asked to eat a meal, that's one of the first things they'll say is food doesn't taste as, uh, uh, you know, flavorful as it usually does. Um, so what we get on our tongue is very minimal, actually. You know, we get those kind of core, what we call the core flavors of salt and sweet uh, and, you know, bitter and, and those things. But um, most of our sense of flavor comes from smell, about 75 to 80 percent probably. But beyond that, um, we get a lot of our sense of flavor from what we see and even what we hear and touch, both in terms of textures and temperatures. But now we're going to shift away from that a little bit and kind of talk about um, higher mental processes that play a role in taste. And this has to do with how what we know, what we understand, what we study can influence what we taste. And to get us into that, we've met this master sommelier, Stephen Poe. Um, and I told you a little bit about, about what master sommeliers do, right? Um, uh, these are the folks that train the sommeliers that you're likely to encounter in high-end restaurants. So these are very, very thoroughly trained individuals when it comes to wine. Um, and there's uh, really not very many, uh, and certainly, you know, given the number of people who would love to be master sommeliers, I met, I met somebody um, recently uh, who uh, owns a vineyard um, in Napa Valley, and he said that at one point he was training to be a master sommelier, but it was just taking him so much time, he decided that he had to be happy with what he learned for his vineyard for producing wine and not go through the full process, because the process takes forever, uh, especially the last of the exams, this blind taste. It sometimes can take people uh, three to five years to pass this exam. And this is a, an exam, as we discussed, that involves uh, sipping wines from um, uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, typically, they're all reds or they're all whites, but um, uh, they are uh, very similar in a lot of ways to make it challenging for the person who is taking the test. Um, and what they will have to do is, I think in a 25 minute period, um, they will have to identify the type of grape variety. Is it a Zinfandel? Is it a, a Merlot? Um, uh, you know, uh, any, any, any wine, your favorite wine is probably one of the categories as well. Um, the region the grape was grown in and bottled, uh, is it from France? Is it from Napa Valley? Somewhere in Australia? Um, and uh, the vintage, which means the year that it was bottled. And so they're going to have to know, um, the, uh, the student will have to know uh, the, um, how climate uh, affects the flavor of wine and what the climate was like in the, the, the major regions of, uh, of uh, wineries around the world in a particular year. So it would have to be something like, you know, um, a Napa Valley wine, um, say a Zinfandel, and it, uh, uh, it has this sweetness to it. So it would be from, you know, probably the, the uh, late 90s or something like that, where there was this type of climate, maybe a lot of warm weather that um, would have an influence on the uh, wine. So that's a lot of detail to know. 
Um, and as I said, they are judged by their accuracy. They have to be able to identify the wines correctly. But more than that, and in some ways more importantly than that, they have to share their reasoning as they go through the exam. They have to say, here is why I'm, why I'm reaching these conclusions. Um, I'm reaching this conclusion about the the region because of this constellation of flavors. I'm re reaching uh, this conclusion about the year based on this constellation of flavors. And of course, as they're describing the uh, constellation of flavors, they have to be very, very um, detailed, very vivid. You know, they, they uh, these are folks who are, are, are trained to not only um, train the the Somali Somali areas that are in the the restaurants, but um, you know they should be able to describe um, uh, you know this to to anybody, and that that's an important thing. Oh, and then the final thing I wanted to mention is they are they sit there in front of three masters that have passed and have also then after they've passed and become master sommeliers are then trained to uh, judge how other people uh, do on this part of the exam. So, you know, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my experience talking to Stephen Poe. Um, I, I've had friends in my life that are serious wine snobs. Um, not too many. Um, you know, a lot of my friends drink beer and, and if they drink wine, uh, you know, they like wine, but they're not snobs. But I've had a couple of friends that have been serious snobs and I used to go to their parties, um, you know, to ostensibly learn about wine. but you know, I, I'm not that big of a fan, but it would be the sort of thing where they would try to trick each other, where they would try, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd have a bunch of wine snobs together and, and uh, um, you know, uh, cover the bottle so nobody knew what was going on and try to, you know, fool each other into thinking it was something else and then laugh at each other. It wasn't my sort of idea of fun, but it was my idea of what a wine connoisseur, true connoisseur was like. They were a little you know, a little uh, uh, prissy about this, a little, you know, kind of holier, uh, you know, they, they they knew more about wine and they would flaunt it. And so before I talk to Stephen Pope, I'll be honest with you, I was a little nervous that he was going to, you know, um, be a little, you know, maybe, you know, condescending, maybe was the word I was ex expecting to just use to describe him because I don't drink a lot of wine. I drink beer. I, you know, I like different beer. I, you know, enjoy different types of beer. So I understand what, what, you know, kind of the, the, the idea of experiencing wines might be like, but I was nervous. And then I, I chatted with him and it turns out he was the nicest, most down to earth wine drinker I've ever met in my life. And I, I talked to him about this. I said, you know, I was really worried that you were going to be a little snooty about all this. And he said, no, listen, um, I, I, he said, I, I just want people to have the chance to enjoy wine as much as I do. And if they don't, that's fine. If they enjoy beer more than wine, more power to them. But I want to be here as a resource for people who want to enjoy wine. And I would never put anybody down. I wouldn't want to at all, you know, uh, deflate their their enjoyment. I want even the, the, the you know, young beginning wine drinker to enjoy it um, and to feel good about how they're enjoying it. And I think that's just a wonderful approach. And because of that, we had a wonderful interview. Um, you're going to hear, you know, I've got some quotes here uh, in the book and on the slides that are going to make him sound kind of snooty. But he was. I mean, he was really, he was like, you know, he was really, he was, a, uh, what did he, he was, a, uh, he played soccer on the weekends and he was ex Marines and, and, you know, uh, you know, only dressed up when he had to. I mean, it was very, very down to earth guy. But when it came to wine descriptions, he, you know, he's very knowledgeable, very detailed and pretty technical. So he was conveying to me what it was like um, uh, during his uh, blind tasting test, uh, the last one. He took it three times, I believe. And his last one is the one he passed. And he was telling me that it was really, really challenging and high pressure. And he was having a particularly difficult time with the last of his six wines. I mean, the clock was ticking and he really wasn't sure what it was. 
and and rather than kind of you know me trying to convey the details, I I'm going to you know convey the way he told me because you're going to see what sort of technical expertise and how that technical expertise is used to to show how this is done. So oh let me make sure I can okay sorry I'm just going to move things around here okay uh, so so I can read this. I remember that I was working to identify the last of my six wines, right from Steve Pope. Uh, time was running out. I had looked at the wine's leg. So I'm going to describe what this is for, you know, those of you, including me, uh, that don't know very much about wine. What the wine's legs are is, you know, when you when you look at a, a clear glass of wine and you kind of spin it around the glass um, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, kind of throw it up a little bit so it, it hits the side and then kind of eases down, the, the wine eases down along the side of the glass. The way that the um, the fluid kind of eases off the inside of the glass, which, you know, that you could imagine seeing, right, is it going to come down fast, slow, is called the legs, and it is very informative about an aspect of the wine. I believe it um, uh, has to do with the sugar content. The more sugar that's in the wine, the more it sticks to the inside of the glass, and the slower it will come down. And I think there's other aspects of its of its kind of slipping down the inside of the glass that's going to tell you things. I looked at the wine's legs. I inhaled its bouquet and then taken a sip. I was trying to describe it as if it were, it were an overripe cabernet cabernet syrah blend, cabernet syrah blend, probably from Australia meaning that it was probably overly sweet and, and had uh, a mixture of, of, you know, these both Cabernet and Syrah blend, uh, grapes in there, probably from Australia. And I guess Australia is now becoming a, a known country for wine production. But something just didn't seem right, says Stephen Coe. I thought about, uh, I thought again about its characteristics. It was a little bit of off dry, so I could imagine that it wasn't too sweet. It had a little bit of an, uh, a dry flavor to it. I don't know exactly what off dry means. It was big, meaning that it had a very kind of bold flavor. It wasn't subtle. Um, and it had high alcohol, which I, I imagine we could taste high alcohol content, you know, kind of, I think we have a sense of what high alcohol tastes like usually if we've had alcohol drinks. And it had a spiciness. Um, and it tasted a little of dried raisins. Okay, so I guess that means, you know, raisins that um, uh, don't have a lot of, you know, freshness to them. They've, they, you know, they taste like, you know, they've been, a, they've been in your cupboard for a little while. Okay. And then it just clicked, he says. I thought, oh my gosh, this is an Amarone, which is a red wine from Veneto, Italy. It was one of those situations where the studying and the focus just took over. And so what he's conveying here is that um, he had to kind of, you know, evaluate and reevaluate all the flavors until the kind of understanding of the, how the wine was produced and, you know, what the sort of different flavor constellations were that um, uh, really uh, um, kind of gave away what the wine was, and, and he turned out to be turned out to be right. Um, so. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how these folks study, but what I have here is a, a video I found, not of Stephen, but of somebody else who's practicing for his blind tasting exam so he can become a master sommelier. And so I thought I'd give you a little sense of what this is like, and hopefully the video will work well. And you can hear it. Cheese rind, honey. Lots of honey. That will do it. Um, wine is off dry. Medium intensity. Medium body. Frame of the wine, acidity is high. Tannin low, alcohol, medium. Fruits have changed a little bit on the uh, on the palate. I'm getting some apricot, peach notes, a little stone fruit, along with the uh, lemon lime. And that Meyer lemon is converted into key lime. Quality is medium. 
find a conclusion, Shannon, Francis, Luan, and, uh, for this at Foo Fray. Uh, what is right? Uh, Demi, Sack, and Vintage. In 2009, is so he's absolutely correct in that example. Um, you know, he's learning. I'm not sure he'd be correct in all the examples, but that's really pretty amazing, including being able to tell when the year was. So he knew, needs to know so much about that that region. He needs to know the the weather across a you know a number of years um, to know what it would uh, taste like, how that weather would have an effect. Okay. So let's talk a little bit. Oh, before I, I, I just to give you a general sense about how they do this. Now that you've seen it, uh, uh, you know, uh, done on video. Um, really, what it is is um, book study, really, um, and wine tasting. So this is how they do it. He said that you know when he was studying and practicing for his blind tasting exam, he would have books and books of uh, of, of that would describe wine production techniques and the flavor constellations, the groups of flavors um, that these different production techniques would uh, create. Um, and so he would read, and then as he was reading about a particular wine, he would have a bottle there and he would sip. Um, as you can see, they do a lot of uh, spitting out because after a while, I can't imagine if, they, if they're actually drinking it, they're gonna wanna study too much. So, um, you know, they read, take a sip, read more, take a sip, spit, um, until they feel like they can taste all the flavors that should exist based on, you know, the type of grape, the type of uh, soil, the, the, the weather, the production techniques, all of that stuff that he's reading about in these books. So he said he had, you know, tons of books, you know, in his, in his room while he was studying. Um, so he could know what all these different wines should taste like, and then he would confirm that they do taste like that, and then make sure he could experience those tastes as he was learning. So it's it's like studying for your exam, right? You know, don't forget to study. Remember we talked about this, even though it's an open book, you got to study, you only have 90 minutes. So it's like studying um, for an exam. You go through the book, you go through your notes. Uh, if someone's lecturing about something, you go through all that stuff, right? And um, uh, the thing about when you're doing it with wine is you can kind of, you know, kind of enact what the sensory experience should be like as you're learning all of the stuff you're studying out of books. Okay, so that's what I mean here. You taste what you understand. And as Stephen Poe is trying to understand more and more about wine production, it allowed him then to taste these nuances that these different wines had based on all the things that go into a wine's production. So as it turns out, because of this type of, of expertise, you know, the fact that you're, you're learning something through, you know, basically rote learning um, uh, to improve your sensory skills, it turns out it, it, when it comes to sensory expertise, wine experts, sommeliers, are one of the most studied populations. So there's a bunch of research on this, which is nice. I mean, this is something that we can we can now learn about. What distinguishes in, a wine expert like Stephen Poe from the rest of us that are not wine experts? Um, it's interesting because you would think, let's, let's think about it, if you, how you might test this, right? Um, and I, you know, we're just kind of amateur uh, a perceptual psychologist this quarter. How would you, you have Stephen Poe and he said, I'd love to be in your experiment. Let's see if we can determine what makes me different from people that aren't wine connoisseurs, that aren't master sommeliers. You say, okay, one of the first things I think I'd like to do, Stephen, is ask you to determine um, uh, with your eyes closed, which of these two glasses of water has a drop of wine in it? Okay, so this would be determining his threshold for wine, right? You might come up with the same experiments, not a bad idea. Is he more sensitive when it comes to detecting that a wine is present? So he puts on his blindfold. We have two glasses of wine. I'm sorry, oops, two glasses of water. We'll put them in wine glasses because he's used to drinking them out of there. We have two glasses of water. And what I did beforehand is I put an eyedropper of a single drop into this glass, and this glass does not have it. And I have him sip the two glasses of water, 
and can he tell which one it is? And he sip it. He's like, no, I really can't. I'd be guessing, um, and I'd say it's this one. In this case, he'd be wrong. I'd say, okay, let's put another drop to see if that allows you. So in the same glass, I put the first drop in. I put another drop in. Okay, and he sips both. He says, no, I still can't tell. They both taste clearly like clear water to me. I don't taste wine. Okay, that's fine. Let's put a third drop into that glass that has the first two in. Okay, and now he'll step and say, "Ah, I can tell that it is this one." Now I taste the wine. My, this must be three drops of wine is my threshold. Now I can tell there's a wine there. Cool. Okay, we'll do other experiments with Stephen, but let's go to you now. How many drops do you think you would need, assuming you're not a master sommelier or a wine connoisseur? How many drops do you think you would need? to determine that the wine's there. Would you need more than Stephen Poe? You would think yes, but the answer is no. You would only need three drops as well, okay? And then you'd say, yeah, I taste a little wine in this glass. Um, it must be this glass, not that one, right? It's not like you need 10 drops of wine or, or even six drops of wine. You would be able to tell with three little eyedropper drops of wine that this is the glass that has the little bit of wine in it. So you and Stephen Poe have the same taste thresholds for wine, which is interesting. It's not like his tongue is more sensitive to tasting wine, okay? Here's another way we could do this. So there's two things that this uh, uh, sentence says. It says, wine experts have no better taste thresholds. That we've just established in our little experiment. You would think that he would notice wine sooner, but he doesn't. What about discriminative abilities? What does that mean? We would do this because it's a very similar experiment, but we're not going to use water. We're going to use two uh, of the same glasses of wine. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, so we have the exact same wine here and here. Say it's a, a, a Cabernet, right? Don't worry about, uh, you know, where it's from and all that sort of stuff. But these are the same glasses of wine. But what we're going to do now is take um, a, a Zinfandel over here and put a single drop of Zinfandel in the Cabernet. Don't worry about these terms. I'm just trying to you know, make it a little bit more intuitive for you. But what we have here are two glasses that are largely the same wine, but one of them has a tiny drop of another type of wine. Can Stephen Poe now tell the difference? Okay. Nope, they taste exactly alike to me. Okay. Let's do this again. Let's put another drop of Zinfandel in. And a, can you taste the difference? No, they taste exactly the same. Another drop. Now I can tell the difference. I know that this has something else in it that it didn't before. These are no longer the same glasses of wine. There's Stephen Poe's threshold for being able to discriminate the wines. What about you? Okay, could you tell right off the that there's no difference so you couldn't so let me put a single drop here nope two three at three drops you'd also be able to tell the difference you don't need 10 drops to be able to taste the difference even though you're not an expert so maybe surprisingly okay you um are like Stephen Poe when it comes to detecting that a wine is present and detecting that there's differences between wines kind of a little surprising given what, you know, how impressive he is. So there's got to be something else that distinguishes you, and we're going to learn that. But it, it's interesting. This is kind of a, a, um, a well, this surprised me a little bit. Um, so I had to talk to Stephen about it. Um, uh, it. You know what I could do um, if, say you're a red wine drinker. Um, if you were to to, to um, come over to my place and I didn't have any red wine, I only had white wine in the house, okay? Um, what I could do to make you think you had red wine is put a little food coloring in white wine. And if I had you then smell the wine, you would say that it absolutely smelled like white w red wine, even though it was a white wine that it had a little food coloring, okay? So that's not only true of you, that's true of Stephen Poe. So this wine color illusion, okay, where I think that I can get you to think that you are at least smelling and in many cases drinking a red wine based on having a white wine with nothing but food coloring in it, okay, not only works with you, it also works with Steve. 
And, you know, I, I was really surprised by this. I said, you know, there's this kind of a, a well-known experiment that suggests that you can fake your friends out by putting uh, uh, red food coloring and white wine and they'll think they're drinking red wine. Do you think that would work on you? He said, well, I don't know if I would necessarily um, taste that it was a red wine. I probably might be able to taste it was white. But when it comes to smell, yeah, because I know my experience of smell is very influenced by what I'm looking at. And in fact, I, I think that's one thing that the, the, the you know, students that are trying to become master sommeliers um, realize is that what the wine looks like is critical to how it tastes. So, you know, it does, it is consistent with what we learned in our dark restaurant and all that fruit drink research, but for it to actually fool Steve Poe, at least into thinking he's smelling a red wine, which is actually a white wine with food coloring in it, is really interesting. So wine connoisseurs, master sommeliers are not um, distinguished from us on that either. So what is it? And fortunately, there's been enough research recently to be able to look at the, the brains of master sommeliers to see if they react differently to wine than how we, our brains react when we're drinking wine. There are differences. So when Steve Poe sips a wine, okay, he will show an enhanced activity in areas where we believe the sense of smell and the sense of taste converge. Um, relative to what happens when you and I sip wine. So the, these are all fMRI, you know, uh, we, uh, the functional magnetic resonance imaging experiments where we put people on this, you know, giant device, which, which is really a big magnet around, around the people. Um, and we have them sip wine <laughs> inside of this thing. I don't know, if they, they now have fMRIs where you can sit up and these things are kind of around your head, but it probably back when these experiments were conducted, they had to lie down and they probably had some sort of straw going to their mouth. And, um, you know, when you and I would be in these experiments, you know, our brains would show one thing. When Steve Poe or someone like him was in these experiments, he would show more activity, disproportionately more activity in areas where smell and taste converge. So that's interesting. It sounds like, you know, there's a, a, a piece of processing that goes on there um, that's different from Steve Poe relative to the rest of us. Again, it's not going to improve his taste thresholds, but it's probably going to improve his ability to um, taste complexity when it comes to smell and taste. Another really interesting thing that happens with Stephen Poe or any wine connoisseur when he sips wine is he's going to show greater left hemisphere activity. Let's get this down and then we'll spend some time explaining it. Um, we haven't really talked very much in the class uh, about uh, brain responses uh, when it comes to the hemispheres, right? I don't know if we've mentioned it at all. Um, but you might have learned something about hemispheric differences. Hemispheres are just, you know, the two sides of your brain, right? Um, when you look at my um, bald head here, you know, could take a little line here and know that this is my right hemisphere, my left hemisphere. This shows a, kind of a, a upper view, a bird's eye view looking down on a brain, uh, left, right. Oh, you know, hold on. I'm in my office. Might as well use this. This might be the first time I'm actually using this little brain in my class. How fun, okay? Because um, I usually don't bring it to class. Um, this is, uh, from my perspective, this is my right hemisphere. This is my left hemisphere. This is my brain, by the way, I took it out. This is the right hemisphere. This is the left hemisphere, okay? Nice brain, cool. All right, um, what happens when Stephen Poe, oh well, yeah, I should say this first. You, you have, may have learned that for right-handed people now, for folks that are uh, right-handed, uh, the hemispheres are known to somewhat divide their function. Now, let's not go overboard on this because you can look things up on the internet that will uh, try to determine if you're more of a right brain person or a left brain person. And don't take that stuff seriously. I mean, it, you know, um, it's fun to think of it like that because, you know, here you have a concrete uh, model 
of what might be making us different from other people, or maybe we have different learning styles and more of a left hemisphere learner or right hemisphere learner. It's not that clear cut at all. But we do know that there are certain things the left hemisphere does um, a, a little bit more efficiently than what the right hemisphere does. The left hemisphere we believe is, is more suited for language, maybe mathematics, maybe, maybe um, uh, more analytical sorts of uh, tasks, where the right side of the brain um, maybe is better at spatial tasks, uh, you, know, um, you know, maps, um, uh, recognizing faces, that sort of thing. We'll be talking about these things again when we discuss face perception. But, you know, this is the kind of very general uh, kind of uh, division. And I, I even hate to use the word division because we do know that the right hemisphere is used for language, especially when it comes to like metaphors and stuff. And the left hemisphere can be used for face perception when it comes to looking at individual features. Everything's really spread around. The brain's a mess when it comes down to it. But we can say that when we see more left hemisphere activity, um, that um, it probably means that there's a more analytical process going on. Again, this is for right-handed people. You know, if you've learned anything about hemispheric differences, um, you know that um, the hemispheres are kind of, uh, um, kind of, uh, their 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 relative functions are different from right-handed versus left-handed versus ambidextrous people. And you know, the majority of people are right-handed, so a lot of what I'll be talking about is is the uh, um, research regarding right-handed people. I don't know what goes on with left-handed people and wine tasting, I should say that. But anyway, the research that's done on right-handed um, wine experts shows that they have greater left hemisphere activity, which is interesting. They take a sip and it suggests that maybe they're going through a more analytical process, okay? a more analytical process, which is interesting. That makes some sense, right? Um, so let's get that down. Um, uh, they're doing an analysis, right? Like uh, an, an analysis that that might be maybe a little bit more conscious, might you know involve um, you know at least uh, internally thinking wise, thought wise, um, applying descriptions, applying uh, language, that sort of thing, as they're sipping, which does not tend to happen with those of us that are not wine experts. When I take a sip of wine, it's very unlikely that I'm activating left hemisphere uh, activity um, like Stephen Poe does, because I don't have that ability to apply all those terms and all those kind of um, thought processes to wine. So that, that's very sensible. That's, that's a very sensible thing. The other thing that wine experts show is that areas in the brain, which I, I think are going to be mostly here, and don't quote me on that because I don't, I don't do brain, I don't do re research directly on the brain, but it's generally thought that things having to do with memory and language areas, again, probably up here in the left hemisphere towards the front here, are also activated more than Stephen Poe. Okay, um, so not only do these experts show um, more potential uh, analytic processing, but also activation in memory to probably facilitate that processing and activation in language areas, which are down here, okay? um, which are going to be helping also the analytical process, right? And that makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna put my brain down for now. That makes a lot of sense when you think about it, because that's what Stephen Poe is so good at. His, his analytical processing comes from everything he studied, his, his memory of all this information about wine production techniques and wine regions and weather patterns and all this stuff, and his ability to describe his sensory experience as he sips wine. You heard some of the terms that guy in the video used, off dry, um, Meyer lemony, uh, changing to key lime. I 
think I can kind of understand what that is. You guys know what Meyer lemons are? They're kind of, well, my wife's really into Meyer lemons. She uses them in cooking. Uh, they're, they're lemons, they're, you know, kind of standard looking lemons, maybe a tiny bit smaller, uh, um, but they uh, are a little bit sweeter. Um, and it's kind of fun to include those in cooking, especially like desserts and things like that. Um, so when he said his wine tasted like Meyer lemon, that then changed to key lime and, and, and key lime is like, I think like a dessert, right? Key lime pie. I think, I, I think I've enjoyed key lime pie. Um, so, you know, he was using, you know, a lot of citrus description for, you know, a very small component of a wine. That's a, that's a tremendous thing to be able to do is to have all of this terminology um, available to you. I mean, you can imagine how it, you know, kind of facilitates your analytical processes, processes as you're sipping the wine. So I think these are very sensible differences that these wine connoisseurs have. Just remember that these are kind of higher level processes when it comes to detecting wine, when it comes to the, even detecting that there's a difference between two wines, they're no better. But when it comes to how you can do an analytical process to allow you to categorize wine, to allow you to identify wine, that's where things get interesting. So we can conclude by saying experts like Steve Poe have a sophisticated conceptual understanding of wine and a descriptive language. And that we believe make, I mean, that makes sense based on what we can see them do, but also what, um, what uh, uh, the brain imaging shows as they're sipping wine. They don't need to say anything at all right, to show that all of these regions um, are activated. It's pretty cool. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so what we're saying here is, is this. So let's continue talking about what, what the research shows and then what Stephen Poe can, can do, what this sort of process might be like. What Stephen told me is that this explicit knowledge, okay, knowing all the wine production techniques uh, uh, and the regional kind of methods um, the uh, type of soil that's being used in a region, the type of weather, weather patterns that are used in a region. Um, all of that explicit knowledge helps um, uh, you have attention to constellations of flavor, meaning that um, the way you recognize a wine is about what group of flavors are uh, involved and knowing that wine production and all these other dimensions that you read about create these constellations of flavors. I've got a concrete example of this. Something called malolactic fermentation. I had no idea what this was either until I talked to Stephen and he uh, told me a little bit about it, then I read about it. What malolactic uh, fermentation is, okay, so you know what fermentation is. You let the wine ferment and that's how it becomes alcohol, right? That's how the alcohol becomes uh, gets into the wine you take the sugar and and you add yeast i guess I've, I've made beer before so i can tell you a little bit about that i don't know i assume it's the same type of thing um there's sugar in the grapes um you get all the juice um then you add yeast and that induces um uh fermentation so now the wine will have alcohol in it the, the sugar becomes alcohol that's how you do beer um but for malolactic fermentation, it's a secondary type of fermentation after the first type of fermentation is done. So you let the wine settle um, after the fermentation process is complete. Um, and you, you could drink it then. But malolactic fermentation is a second type of fermentation. What it does is it, it, it does add a little bit more alcohol, not a lot, I guess. Um, I guess it's, it, it, what you do is you add, I think it's called lactic because you add some sort of sugar that's derived from dairy or something like that. I don't know. You're not going to be tested on malolactic fermentation, but um, if you're interested. Uh, and what that does is it increases the wine's um, alcohol content a tiny bit, but it also importantly changes the flavor. And there are certain types of wines, certain styles of wines from certain regions where that secondary fermentation is done so that the wine now has this group of flavors, right? And those group of flavors, if you're interested, tend to, to, to be buttery texture. I think I can figure out what that would be like, kind of like a smooth texture on the tongue. I could imagine a wine having a smooth texture, right? 
sauerkraut. Well, I know what sauerkraut tastes like. It's, you know, pretty tart stuff that you taste kind of in the back of your mouth. You guys have had sauerkraut, I assume, on hot dogs at some point in your life. Um, uh, so somehow the wine tastes like that, I guess. Okay. And yogurty. I think I know what yogurt tastes like, kind of sour, right? Like sauerkraut, but maybe a different type of sourness, a little bit of a a, a sweeter, softer sourness than sauerkraut, right? And so if a wine has those sorts of flavors to it, Steve Poe would know, ah, it's gone through malolactic fermentation. And now I know something probably about the style of the wine and the region of the wine, because malolactic fermentation isn't done for every wine. In fact, it's done for relatively few wines, you know, relative to the number of wines in the world. So now I can narrow my experience or my, 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 um, my experience is telling me I can narrow the possible wines I'm, I'm sipping uh, down into a, a, a group that goes through this kind of unique malolactic fermentation. Um, so let's, I think I have a quote here. Oh, no. But this is the, ba okay, but this is, this is what he says is the basis. Let me just see what my slides say here. Ah, shoot. Okay. All right. Um, this is the basis of the superior recognition performance. This is how the book learning, the learning he goes through, the books, the learning he goes through, there's probably YouTube videos now too. He uses though one would use those for the master sommelier test as they're studying. All this type of, of explicit knowledge learning can now tell you um, what types of flavor groupings you might expect. And if those flavor groupings do exist, then it can tell you which wine it might be. Okay, so um, imagine this, and I'll have a quote on this in just a second. Say, you know, you're not sure what the wine is, so you're taking a sip, and it does have a buttery texture. Say, oh, I didn't realize that before. I was concentrating on the sweetness, but I just noticed as I took another sip of wine, there is clearly a buttery texture. Well, buttery texture can be a few things, but one thing it can be is uh, uh, it can mean that the wine went through malolactic fermentation. Let me try again, because I know malolactic fermentation isn't just the buttery texture, it's also sauerkraut and yogurt. Let me see if I can taste sauerkraut this time. So he you know, rinses his mouth out with water so it can start from scratch, takes a sip of the wine again, say, yeah. There's a little sauerkraut. So buttery texture sauerkraut. Let's confirm its malolactic fermentation now by tasting for yogurt. Rinses his mouth out with water, takes another sip, and says, yeah, it's got buttery texture sauerkraut yogurt. No question, this wine has gone through malolactic fermentation. I have now narrowed down what wines this could possibly be. And then he moves on to a different type of constellation of flavors. This is what is the basis of uh, their superior recognition of performance. By knowing what the flavor outcomes are of a production technique, um, especially the constellation of flavors, he can try to detect a flavor and then make a guess as to what produced that flavor and then confirm that guess by knowing what other flavor should go along with that first flavor based on what he knows. And in fact, this is why um, uh, the connoisseurs have um, an ability to do things like have more systematic similarity ratings. Okay, what do I mean by that? Okay, so new experiment. Um, we've determined some interesting things about Steve Poe and Master Samoyers. They have no better thresholds. But boy, do their brains do some really, really um, active stuff that non-expert brains um, do when uh, that non-expert brains don't do uh, when they sip wine. Okay. But here's another test. I, I want to see if Steve Poe can do something interesting. I've got a, a, a series of 10 wines here, um, all red. And what I'd like Steve to do is organize them um, into different groupings. Okay. You don't have to do it based on the exact type of wine or anything like that. Just do it based on the flavor and do it quickly. It's not like your master sommelier test, but do it quickly. Um, go ahead. And so I give them to Steve and he takes sips and he groups them. Okay. I'd say we've got three groups here and I can tell you why I grouped them like this. I say, no, I just want to see you group them 
Here's one group of, of four, here's another group of three, and here's another group of three. That's how I brew them. Okay, now I give the same 10 wines to you. you say, this is gonna be hard, but you try your best and you've got uh, you know, a group of two here, a group of four here, uh, a, a group of, uh, of four here. Okay. So, okay, cool. And then I ask you both, oh, I ask you to remember these as best as you can. So take another sip and remember the groups. Okay. And then I send you home and I have you come back the next week. And I have you do the exact same task. I give you the exact same 10 wines um, and I, I ask you to group them as well as you can and try to group them like you did last time. You give them to Steve Poe and guess what? He takes a sip of each and has them in the exact same groups as he did the previous week with very little effort. I give them to you or me. And I say, um, it's like starting from scratch. I have no idea. You see, I remember I had a group of two and then two groups of four. But uh, besides that, I don't know. And you're going to be pretty bad at it. He's going to have these systematic similarity ratings when it comes to wine. And that, again, is based on this kind of superior recognition performance he has by tasting the constellations. You, on the other hand, haven't been trained like that, and you won't be very consistent. Your groups, you might have the same number of groups and the same number of wines in the group, but the chances are they're gonna be all over the place relative to what you had last week. Okay, so now we're seeing their expertise, which is really interesting. I really, I should say, I really love this example of perceptual expertise, because we've talked a lot about, you know, different types of perceptual expertise with, regard to you know Daniel Kish and being able to use reflected sound and the, the the sound engineers as well and the you know the beat baseball batters and and you know the folks that uh, you know have learned to match smells and all that but here's a really cool example where what you're explicitly learning okay, how you're learning about things having to do with wine are those things are changing the way you taste so it's like book knowledge, explicit knowledge is changing your sensory expertise. I think it's, it's a really interesting example of that. Here's, here's another quote from Stephen Poe. I think this will kind of bring the idea home. Um, uh, okay, let me just, I gotta move my, I've got something blocking this here. Yeah. Okay, there's no question that the more knowledge you have, the more your tasting is informed. If you know, for example, that they use a tufa subsoil, okay, so that's some sort of uh, lower soil in the Anjou Samur, France region, then when you're trying a Cabernet and you get that chalky, stony minerality, chalky, I think I can imagine what chalky tastes like, maybe. I've never tasted chalk, but you know, looking at it and smelling it, I can imagine what it might taste like. Stony minerality, yeah, I've tasted rocks. I probably did when I was a kid. I could imagine what that would be like. If I'm tasting those chalky and stony minerality on the wine, you become confident that you're tasting a Cabernet Franc from the Loire Valley, probably Chinois, which is a specific region, I guess. And knowing this can draw your attention to other states associated with that region. So. You notice a taste, a, 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 some type of taste, some characteristic in the wine. You know that can be associated with a number of things. Let's see what, what it is associated with by trying some other flavors. And then so you go ahead and you attend. Your knowledge will help you attend to those other flavors. And that's how you recognize it. It's a really cool example of perceptual expertise, I think. You know, one that I think is very, very kind of, you know, uh, understandable, you know, from a, a non-expert's point of view. Yeah, you can't, I mean, maybe you know things. Like, I'm, I, I'll tell you right now, I'm trying to become a perceptual expert. I'm trying to, I'm recording my own music and I'm trying to make it sound like it's professionally recorded using uh, an Apple uh, app um, called Logic. And I am trying to, you know, learn what, you know, to trying to become an expert, just like, you know, true sound mixers and true uh, uh, producers are doing it. And it's really hard right now when I try, I, I can't hear these things other people can hear, but I know from the perceptual expertise research, including Stephen Poe, 
and these sort of wine experts that the more you learn, you know, me from videos mostly, also a little reading, but mostly from videos, you read, you understand, and in my case, you listen, and you listen for the sort of things they're talking about. It's kind of cool. It's kind of like, a, 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 an, I mean, I think that this, this story helped me have a little confidence that I have to have the patience, and eventually I will be able to, you know, listen like an expert, like Steve Poe can sip like an expert. You can too. That's the point. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. I, 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 in general, we're going to move on from wine tasting now, and we're going to talk about other examples. I just gave you my example, but I don't know that much research on, on the example of becoming an expert listener. I'm sure there, there is now some. There wasn't a whole lot at the time, but there was some examples of visual perception I think you'll find interesting. Um, so these are other examples that go beyond wine tasting where explicit knowledge and all I mean by that again is is you know learning you know like from a book or from somebody telling you something it's kind of different from the experience that uh, uh, Daniel Kish has where it's just kind of going through the, the the experience again and again and again without having this kind of you know kind of conscious uh, access to the information that allows him to perform. Here are instances where we do have conscious access to knowing things like, you know, uh, the out wine, the the, the, con the flavor constellations of a wine, or the the the, the sound dimensions from adding this type of uh, effect to music or something like that. That's a very different type of expertise. So we're talking about this latter type of expertise, like Stephen Pose, chess peeps players, for example. Um, and there's a lot of research on the perception uh, that chess players have when it comes to uh, chess boards. So I don't know if you've seen either movies or videos of expert chess players being portrayed. Um, there's some really neat ones where you have like an expert chess player uh, playing in a park. Um, and um, uh, they will do this type of thing. Um, I guess they make a little money doing this, of course, um, and it's also kind of an interesting thing to, to, to show people that they can do. Um, it will be an expert player who will be playing multiple players at the same time in a live situation. Okay, so um, they'll be in a park, um, standing somewhere in the park with uh, three tables set up around them, three long tables set up around them. Um, you know, like in a horseshoe pattern. And at each of the tables, there's say three, four, maybe five players. So they could be playing anywhere between 10 and 15 players at the same time. They each have chess boards in front of them. They're sitting down on the other side of the table at the chess board um, around the entire perimeter, right? And the expert is standing in the middle. And the expert will go from one chessboard to the next and play these people um, and, you know, uh, try to win. Now, I, I believe it costs some money for them to enter this. And it's, you know, it's kind of a, a fun thing to do if you're, uh, you know, a chess player. You can, you can um, uh, you know, get to ch uh, play a, a professional, you know, an expert. Um, so they pay a little money. Uh, so these folks are good. Don't get me wrong. It's not like, you know, they just take people from the park and say, hey, you want to play an expert to, to sit down in, in this situation. You've got to be pretty good. You're just not a, you know, a master, a chess master. But the chess master, you'll see, they'll go from one table to the next and uh, one, one, one uh, chess board to the next. And, and sometimes they won't even look at the chess board. You know, they'll, they'll look at this table over here and they'll, they'll move a piece. And then they'll go to the one next to them and they'll they'll move another piece and then they'll say oh by the way uh steve uh number five or number number uh 12 back there steve i want to move could you please move my my pawn to uh queen's uh uh rook four or something like that and that that means you know a particular square on the board and they will do that so so the chess master doesn't even really need to look at the board what they've done is they've memorized the boards and they can do this. They can memorize piece configurations. So they can play this many games at once and they don't even really need to look at the boards. These are masters now. These are people who've been doing it for years and years and years and have become masters, of course, from playing, but also from reading, taking classes, watching videos. I mean, it's very similar 
to what Steve Poe does, except they're learning about strategies. They're learning about specific games. I don't know if you if you play chess enough to, to know that they you can read history books on games, right? So in other words, you know, they say here is a here are all the moves in this um, uh, game between Kasparov and Fisher that was done in 1990 something. It's a famous game because it went on for hours and at one point Fisher looked like he was going to win and at one point Kasparov looked like he was going to win. It's very exciting. Here is an entire book chapter dedicated to it and they will read it to be a chess master. You have to read these sort of things. So it's becoming an expert through this explicit knowledge. And yes, they can memorize configurations on the board with very little problem by the time they get to the master level. Okay. However, there is a limitation to how they can do this. They can do many, many boards. I don't know if there's a limitation to the number of boards, but there's a limitation in that all of the positions of the pieces on the board have to be positions that could actually happen based on the rules of chess. Right, so you know there are very very rigid rules of chess. Many of you play, I'm sure you know that you know the the um, rook can only move, uh, the the knight can only move a certain way, the rook can only move a certain way, um, and yeah, you can move all around the board, but you know it's impossible to have certain configurations just based on the rules of chess. If in fact you were to do that, so. You know, say I did this. Say I, I was, I was a kind of a being a wise guy in one of these tournaments, and I was sitting over here, and um, uh, I was, you know, pretending to play the game. But what I did is actually, when the master wasn't looking, he was looking over there. I messed it up and put the pieces in completely random order, and then he came back to look at the board and say, "Okay, memorize that." If the pieces are in a completely randomized configuration where the, the location of the pieces can't actually be there based on the rules of chess, there is no chance that this master would be able to memorize the board. Only when the pieces are in uh, uh, positions that are based on the rules of chess will he be able to do so or she be able to do so. Okay, so they are clearly using the very strict um, rules of chess to do this perceptual memorization. Okay. And, you know, chess is another good one for, for perceptual expertise. There's been a lot of research on um, uh, chess players, chess experts, and how they're able to perform these sorts of things, as well as brain scans, you know. Um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can look it up. But there's also been research on other folks that have expertise, um, visual expertise, because you find you don't have to be a chess expert, you know, if you've ever, you know, coached, say, basketball for many, many years, um, and, you know, musicians, especially um, uh, conductors, um, are known to be able to memorize scores. Uh, so coaches, let's talk about um, basketball, football, football, American football coaches, um, they're able to memorize the position of the uh, um, players before and, and during and after a play is over uh, very, very well. But it's the same thing. It, 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 the coaches are only able to do that. Um, so, they, you know, looking at it like a, a diagram of where the players are going, you know, with, I don't know if you've ever seen these with X's and zeros or whatever. Um, uh, they're able to do this quite well, as are players. I mean, this is how they, one of the ways they're able to memorize, you know, hundreds of plays by, you know, kind of memorizing these uh, kind of configurations of players. Again, though, they're only able to do it if the players um, with the different positions are, in fact, in the correct, you know, um, uh, Config, uh, the correct collection of configurations. Okay? Um, so the center, the one that hikes the ball, can only be in a certain place uh, in front of the quarterback, typically, right? They're going to be with where the ball is, right? So these things can't deviate or they can't do it as well. Musicians, the same thing. And I think one of the, the, the most studied uh, examples is uh, conductors. And the reasons conductors are studied is because they need to memorize not just a single line of music. So if you're a violinist, you're going to be able to uh, uh, memorize the, the, you know, the, the melodies that you're playing, the lines that you're playing. 
But what a conductor needs to do is be able to memorize all the instruments uh, of the orchestra and not just the violins um, versus the cellos, but the first violin versus what the second violin part is and all that sort of thing. And they need to be able to look at the score and then, you know, look away and be able to tell you exactly what was there. And it works. They're quite impressive when they're asked to say reproduce it, you know, just quickly write down now what that looked like. They're amazing at it, but only if the original score is based on the rules of music, especially uh, when it comes to, we talked a little bit about how music can vary from culture to culture. Um, you know, if they are trained uh, to conduct mostly um, uh, musical pieces that are Western, you know, kind of standard Bach, Beethoven, that sort of stuff, um, they're able to do it, but if all of a sudden they were asked to um, conduct from a musical score that had the tonality and the scales of Eastern music, Indian music, for example, without that expertise, they would not be able to memorize that. Right? So again, they're using the, the rules. And it's the same with circuit designers, uh, folks that design circuits. There are uh, certain rules that uh, circuits have to go by in order to be uh, in order to be, you know, workable circuits. It's the same type of thing. They can memorize um, it very, very impressively. It's a very, uh, um, you know, impressive feat of perceptual expertise, but it's limited to how the rules work in that particular field. Same thing with wine, as it turns out. Same thing with with uh, chess players. Um, so let's actually talk about this. Let's talk about a wine example of this. And one experiment that shows this um, is the following. Um, uh, imagine, let's first have you in a, um, uh, uh, an experiment where you are asked to um, memorize uh, word pairs. And in fact, you're told what's going to happen. You're going to memorize a pair of words. Um, and later on, you're going to be shown the first word in your job is to give us the second word in the pair, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, imagine it's something like this. Uh, uh, let's see, table, cabbage come up together, okay? So you're saying, memorize this, because later we're gonna ask you what should come after table um, when you see it alone. You know, memorize that as cabbage. And you know, some of these things, you know, you're gonna have to truly memorize by rope, because table and cabbage don't, you know, really go together naturally. But some of these things are going to be uh, wine destrictors. So full bodied and prune come up. So, oh my gosh. Okay. I'll put, I'll, I'll try to memorize that. Um, full bodied prune. And so with later on, when I see full bodied, I've got to come up with prune. I don't know about you, but if I've got a lot of different terms, wine terms and non wine terms in a big set that takes half an hour to present, so say it's 150 of these pairs come up. When it comes trying to recall that second word when I'm uh, prompted by that first word, I wouldn't do well. My memory ain't that good. Certainly it's not as good as yours now. Um, you would do better on this than me. Um, but when it can, and that would be true, I, I wouldn't be good and, and, and you might be better than me, but you would probably be no better at the wine terms than than, than you would at the other terms, right? I mean, would you be able to remember prune goes with full bodied? No. Steve Poe would. He would ace this test when it came to the prompts during the, the latter part of the experiment. So when full body came up for him during the test phase, he would say prune, no problem. And he would be able to do this with all the wine terms as long as the pairing of the terms was based on the rules of wine. What do you mean rules of wine? Well, now you know, there kind of are rules of wine because there are flavor constellations that go together. In fact, if the um, uh, pairing was something like full-bodied and lime, which is actually a term that goes typically with white wine, he would have a problem memorizing that. He aced the exam relative to us wine novices with the wine terms that made sense to go together. But if the wine terms did not make sense to go together, 
he would be no better than us. So he, again, would have to use his rules for wine, like the chess player uses his rules for chess and the coach uses his rules for football and all that stuff. He has to use it. If you deviate from that, he's no better than the rest of us. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. There's one other thing I want to tell you about experts that I think you're going to find very interesting. Um, there is a phenomenon called the verbal overshadowing effect. And what this involves, hmm, let's see, what's the best way I can tell you about this? Um, yeah, let's do it this way. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> It's not the most pleasant story, but I, I, you know, I, I should say if, you know, it's going to involve, um, I was uh, held up at gunpoint at, at many, many years ago. I'm fine. Everything worked out okay, all that. But I, I, if that story is going to bother you, you know, might just want to step out for five minutes. Um, no violence happened. Everything was okay. But I think it really illustrates this point nicely. I'm just, you know, with a little warning. Um, here's what happened. Um, I was uh, getting out of a car. I was uh, with a friend um, many years back in the early 90s, getting out of a car, and we were going to go into a restaurant together, one of our favorite restaurants. And um, as we were getting out of the, the um, car and turning around to walk towards the restaurant, uh, two gentlemen came up to us um, and asked for our wallets and purses, um, and they had a gun. Um, and, uh, they were pointing it at me. Um, and so <laughs> right away I said, yep, here's my wallet. And my friend said, here's my purse. Go ahead. That's it. Please don't hurt us. There you go. They took them and ran. Okay. That's it. That's the entire interaction. Okay might have been a little bit more talking like don't do anything stupid that sort of stuff you know we just gave everything up it was upsetting clearly we went into the restaurant shaking it's a very scary thing um the restaurant uh folks were wonderful to us we told them what happened they brought us a bottle of wine they brought us food they called the police for us they were very supportive which was nice the police come. Uh, they were there within 10, 15 minutes. Um, and they were also very nice. And, and we were okay. We settled down. You know, we you know, decided we could eat a little bit. We ate slowly, but as the police were talking to us. Um, and it, at one point, the police um, say, okay, uh, tell us what happened. And now can you describe what the people look like? And we did our best. I mean, the whole thing was quick. The whole thing was probably over in about a 30 seconds to a minute. But, you know, we, we potentially they were right there, right in front of us. Um, I do have to say, when you have a gun between you and a person, it's hard to look at anything but the gun. But, you know, I, I was able to, you know, after they put the gun down, we gave them the wallet. I, I was a, certainly able to look at them. And I then described the best I could what they look like. Okay. Um, okay. So the police are say, thank you. I'm so sorry this happened to you. Um, we'll let you know if anything happens. And then right before they were about to leave, they got a call on their little walkie talkie. And it was another police officer who said, hey, we just found these two guys down the street and they uh, were running from the restaurant. Um, they didn't have anything on them, right? They didn't have a wallet or a purse or anything, but they looked like they were running because they had done something. And they kind of fit the description that I guess had been called in. Okay. And they, the police said, do you feel comfortable to go look at them to see if that's them? I said, okay, being nervous about the whole thing, but you know, there's going to be a bunch of police officers there. They didn't find any weapon on these folks. They didn't find any, any they didn't wallet or purse or anything like that. But, um, you know, uh, still it's a little nerve wracking. We said, okay, we'll do it. Uh, so we let our uh, 
who would sit for a few minutes and got in the back of the police car. And they told us this. They said, you know, the way we set this up is you're, you're going to see them. We're going we're gonna to keep you in the back of the police car. Um, we're going to shine lights on them. They're going to be standing in the middle of this, you know, on a side street or something like that. And they will not be able to see into the car because the lights are going to be shining on them. Um, the, you know, they have tinted windows and you're going to be in back. They will not see you. So he said, okay, all right, let's, let's go ahead and do this. You know, we don't want this to happen to somebody else. Let's see if, we can, if it's them, you know, we should take them off the street for now at least. And so um, we go there and uh, there, are the two, there are two guys there and they shine the lights on them, the guys. And I don't know if somebody told them to do this, but they smiled. <laughs> I don't know if that's a known thing that, you know, if you smile, maybe you look less guilty. Maybe you look different from, you know, how you looked when you did the, the, the holding up. Um, and so the police turn to us and say, can you say without doubt that these are the gentlemen that held you up? And I look at my friend and she looks at me and we say, you know, they do fit the description, but we cannot say without a doubt that these are the people. I said, okay, we understand, you know, we're asking you to do something that's hard, um, but thank you for your time. We'll bring you back to the restaurant now. And so they had to let the guys go. That's pretty much the end of the story. I mean, they, we, we never, you know, I had a Never saw the wallet again. She never saw her purse again. We had to cancel our credit cards, but everything was fine, you know. Um, uh, you know, it was a, it was scary certainly, and I, I probably didn't get a lot of good sleep that night. Um, but uh, that's the end of of the story. The restaurant was so nice to us, and they they you know they they paid for the meal. They said, "Come back, we'll pay for another meal. We don't want you to associate this this crime with this restaurant," which was nice. Um, but here's something I want you to know about. And that is this, the fact that we were asked to describe what the perpetrators look like probably hindered our ability to then recognize them. And this is a well-known phenomenon, especially in the uh, literature on, on eyewitness um, uh, uh, behavior, eyewitness testimony, it's called the verbal overshadowing effect. And now it should make sense to you. The fact that I verbally, we verbally described the perpetrators hindered our ability then, or overshadowed our ability then to be able to recognize them. Okay, so the description inhibits recognition. The description inhibits recognition, and this is very well known in the eyewitness uh, uh, testimony literature. We have a good friend who does research on, on eyewitness um, testimony um, and how lineups um, can affect different sort of responses in, in eyewitnesses. And he, he was very aware of this situation. He, what we, what we uh, went through was called a show up. It's not a lineup. There are only two uh, suspects in it. Um, and it was, you know, very close to where the incident happened. Um, but um, he knew that, yeah, I mean, yes, the police apps, I mean, they're, they're left in a tough situation, the police, the detectives, they, they, they want, they need a description, they absolutely need a description, but then they know that the description is going to make it somewhat harder for them to, for us to then recognize it. And that's not just true if we were recognizing them right then, right, you know, whatever it was, half an hour, 45 minutes after the incident happened, if we um, were asked to come in, say, a few days later or a week later and look at a lineup or something like that, the fact that we had gone through a detailed description of their appearance would make us worse at recognizing them. Okay, this is the, the verbal overshadowing effect. Um, interestingly, this not only applies to uh, um, faces and people, it also applies to other sorts of sensory situations. For example, smells and tastes, smells and tastes. So, and this is not just true of wine. Wine's one of the things that it's been uh, tested with often. It's also true with, um, uh, you know, things like custards, like we talked about, and, and uh, you know, different types of smells like perfumes and that type of thing. Let's go with perfume. If you, and th this is something that the, the producers of perfume have to, ha are very aware of when they, when they ask people for descriptions. Say you come in and you're asked to describe a series of perfumes, maybe five different perfumes. 
um, and uh, you describe it the best you can. Um, I say it's a little floral, it's a little spicy, and eh, you know, I don't know what other terms I could come up with. Um, it, it smells a little damp. I don't know, kind of like like damp, you know, damp clothing a little bit, or you know, it smells like linen or something like that. This smells a tiny bit like baby powder. I don't know, I'm coming up with things. And then I put that smell away. Um, and I do the same thing with five other smells. If I were then asked later on in that day, maybe even within an hour or um, uh, you know, a week later, um, to determine whether or not this is one of the smells I had smelled the previous time I was here in the lab, I would be worse at recognizing that smell than if I hadn't described it at all. And this is very true of uh, uh, wine too. I mean, wine's one of the things that's absolutely been studied on. So I come in, I take a sip of wine, I do my little wine novice best to describe it. Mm, it's sweet and a little spicy. I've learned some other terms now, maybe I can use them, let's see. Off dry, I don't know. <laughs> I don't do a great job, but I do I do it, you know, my best. I concentrate, I write down, you know, maybe there's a, a, a an instruction to, you have to have at least five different descriptors of that wine. So I do my very, very, very best as a non-wine expert, okay? And then um, this wine, we don't want you, this here, here's another wine. This wine, we don't want you to describe, we just want you to sip it and just try to remember, to sip it. Yeah, both of these things I'm trying to remember. And then we come back uh, the next day and I sip the two wines. I, um, uh, and I have a whole bunch of other wines that I, I didn't sip the day before and I'd be asked to recognize the wines. I would do worse with this wine because I had described its detail. I had written down these descriptors than I would for this other wine that I didn't have to describe. So verbal overshadowing, inhibits my recognition of faces in the case of, of uh, eyewitness testimony, um, smells when it comes to perfume, and um, wine when it comes to uh, being able to recognize a wine by sipping it the second time. Okay, That's true of me, and I'm not even a casual wine drinker. Let's see, my wife is more of a wine drinker than I am, but she's very casual as well. Um, that's what her experience would be like if she were asked to describe the wine, it would actually make it worse for her when it came to recognizing that wine later. But not so with Stephen Poe, right? Not so with Stephen Poe. He would describe that wine, okay, in the detailed way he does, and that would actually facilitate, it would um, increase his chances of recognizing that wine the second day. So it does just the opposite. His ability to recognize the wine is actually enhanced by going through a detailed description. He is not affected uh, by the verbal overshadowing effect. It, it does not happen with him when it comes to wine. In fact, the verbal um, uh, work probably helps his ability to later on recognizing that wine. And that would be true of a perfume producer, somebody who makes perfume and is able to go through all of the descriptions that are required to recognize the perfume uh, and all those sort of things would probably help that person um, then recognize the perfume later. And it, I, I don't know this for certain, but I believe somewhere, it's not in the book, but I believe somewhere I read that you know who's not affected by verbal overshadowing when it comes to faces? It's the folks that do the draw, the, you know, the, the um, likeness. So imagine the police came with a third person who will draw um, uh, the, a, a drawing of the perpetrator based on my description. I believe that they are so used to hearing how descriptions get transferred or, or transformed into faces and knowing all the components of a face that they are also not affected. It's not in the book, you're not being tested on it, but that would be kind of consistent, right? What you do need to know is that Stephen Bow is one of those few folks that is not affected by verbal overshadowing when it comes to wine tasting. Okay. 
Any questions on verbal overshadowing uh, when it comes to faces or, or wine drinking or any of these other kind of perceptual expertise examples. So what I did here on this slide and what I do at the end of that chapter is expand this perceptual expertise, this explicit knowledge based perceptual expertise um, example um, by going into other examples outside of tasting and, and hopefully that gives you a sense of how it might work. The rules are absolutely important and because they have such, you know, uh, skill with the verbal um, descriptions, they can, um, you know, not uh, fall prey to the overshadowing effects, verbal overshadowing effects. Okay, cool. I think this is actually a good place to stop because what we'll do after our break is that we will um, uh, shift our discussion to uh, uh, touch, which is going to be, as I said, not material for the midterm, but material for the final. So when we come back after our 10 minute break, we'll start on our discussion of touch.
Okie dokie. Hold on just a second. All right. Good. Uh, are there... Here, let me go ahead and post this up here. Hold on just a second. And... Are there uh, any questions on anything? Um, anyone that come up with anything for the test or anything like that before we continue? Okay. Um, just to remind you, we have now finished everything, all the material, all the lecture material for the first uh, test. Um, the material from here on in will be uh, on your final. Uh, I don't know where to start to study. Um, Okay, um, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, Jun Mai. Um, uh, are you asking um, for uh, tips on how to study, or are you you wondering where it's a lot of stuff? Yeah, um, you know, but it, it should be very straightforward. It's uh, concentrate with uh, uh, concentrate on what's in the lecture. Uh, majority of the questions come right from lecture. Um, and then make sure you have the material in your discussion sections that uh, wasn't covered in lecture. That's important too. And then, you know, there's a lot of overlap um, from the lecture and book, um, but do look at the uh, material that's uh, in the book that was not covered in lecture. Um, again, there's, you don't need to know uh, really any details about the interviews or uh, um, you know, the interview subjects, um, much more interested in you understanding the concepts um, uh, probably won't be talking very much about um, the details of any experiments that I didn't talk about in lecture. Uh, so, you know, if you if you understand, if let's put it this way, if you understand everything that's in lecture, you're going to do well. Um, but uh, uh, to do very, very well, you want to also understand um, everything that uh, I didn't talk about that's present in the book and discussion section. Okay, and don't forget, you have an, an hour and a half is a long time to do 60 questions. I mean, it's, you know, um, shouldn't take more than, you know, what, 15 to 20 seconds per question the first time you go through it to read through it. Um, so, you know, if you think of it like that, it's not too bad. And then, you know, if you think, oh, this is not something I remember him saying in, in class, in lecture, you can look it up in the book. You know, you know how to do that. Um, so, you know, I think it's more manageable than you realize. Okay. Other questions about the exam? Okay. Great. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, continue our discussion. And as I said, we're moving now. Oops. Roger didn't ask me. Hold on just a second. Let me do that again. I'm going to stop sharing and share again. Uh, something didn't work. Okay. I think we're okay. So we are now going to discuss um uh touch I think we're okay. yeah good and um let me tell you a tiny bit about this chapter this, this turns out and it, it won't be today's lecture it will probably be tuesday's lecture this turns out to be a a more um uh technically challenging uh topic um because what we're going to do is we're going to use our um uh survey of touch to understand something about the kind of mechanics of plasticity. Um, so plasticity is something we've been discussing um, throughout the quarter. We talked about it in the very first class. Um, and then when we were discussing Daniel Kish about there being changes in his brain um, that probably support his ability to echolocate and you know, that we call that plastic changes or plasticity. And because that's such an important aspect of, um, of these kind of perceptual skills that we've been talking about through the quarter, uh, it's important we understand a little bit about the mechanics of what goes on with plasticity. Now, it's also important you remember that this is not a class for majors and it's not a class for neuroscientists or anything like that. This is a class for, for fun and kind of general conceptual understanding. Um, but um, we're going to 
get a little bit more technical as we go through this chapter, but we're going to do it in such a way that hopefully you'll find um, understandable and uh, interesting. So you understand why it's important. We understand plasticity and what happens with plasticity, and then you can apply it to your own situations. Much of what we'll be talking about is how plasticity supports learning of new skill. And some of these new skills that we'll be talking about are just amazing. Um, and I'll be uh, introducing you to a, a person now uh, named John Bramblett, who I think you'll find really interesting. Um, there he is, painting. Uh, John uh, lost his vision um, completely. He went completely blind by the time he was in his 20s. He started losing his vision earlier um, uh, in his teens. And you'll, he'll, I'm going to about to show you a video. He'll tell you why. Um, but um, interestingly, after he lost his sight, he decided to take up painting. He hadn't really painted much before. His, uh, you know, what little experience was like from, you know, when you're a kid and you're, you're in kindergarten or whatever, and you're, you know, doing stuff in, in you know, just for fun. Um, his mom uh, had, is a painter by hobby. Um, so, you know, in some ways, maybe, you know, there's a genetic component to it, but I can't imagine there's a genetic component that would help somebody who didn't have access to vision learn to paint. So how does he paint? Well, you're seeing, you're seeing it there. He is painting through his sense of touch. Um, and you'll see he has some very practical, very um, solid ways that he has learned to use his sense of touch to help him to paint. So let's watch a little bit of this video. My sight went very slowly at first. I, I didn't even realize it when, it when I first noticed I was having trouble with my sight. Um, I, I was already really twice over the legal limit for being blind. There were just less and less things I could do. I couldn't go out as much, or if I did, I needed assistance. There were just so many things I couldn't do. I just had a lot of anger building up. Yeah, I didn't even realize. I didn't even realize I was that angry, but I um, started painting. I don't know, so much as an outlet or a way of defiance in a way. You know, something that, that is viewed as very visual. After a while, I, I, I started becoming less and less angry. The more I painted, the more... I could let that out, and to where, to where now, it, it just, you know, I have to paint. You know, starting painting was almost sort of a crazy thing in a way. I mean. I decided I just was going to do it. I just, I, I needed, I, I couldn't write. You know, I, I didn't have a computer at the time that could read to me. I feel like if I didn't have an, uh, some sort of creative outlet, I was going to go crazy. I just needed to put something out there. In a way, it was out of anger. I mean, it was a way of, um, like, giving the middle finger to the universe or God or, or whatever you want to call it. You know, saying, well, I may not be visual, but I'm still going to do this. I'm still going to try. And, um, and I really didn't care what it looked like. I didn't care if it was visually appealing. I just wanted to do it. I thought the physical action of painting, of, of, um, of putting what, what's in my mind out there, actually in the physical world, even if no one else liked it, I wanted to create something like that. That's really what got me into it. And I um, went and got some oil paints and, um, and just started. I told my mom that um, I started painting and she was like, oh, that's great. She was so worried when her and my dad came over one day and she wanted to be so supportive and she didn't want to let me down, but she was so relieved when she looked at it. She liked it and she actually liked it. I lost my vision is um, 
I have a seizure disorder. I've had it ever since I was a kid. The seizure will start in the front and it'll hit the back where the occipital lobe is. Because you actually see back here, the, 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 the optic nerve travels from your eyes around to the very back. So that my eyes work, I get light in, but the brain, the part that deciphers the image, doesn't know what to make with it. So it's sort of like a TV that you have on, but there's no signal, there's no antenna or cable or anything attached. So it's just like a, it's just snow. It's just from the from the seizure, which is rare, uh, it turns out. So. But if you have enough of them, yeah, it'll do it. problem when doing a painting is you can't see it visually is keeping oriented on, on the canvas and knowing exactly where, where you are um, and, and what you've done. I've always drawn using pencils or pens but you can't feel pencils or pen strokes once you put them down and so I, um, I started using Elmer's glue because it dries and it's hard but Elmer's glue takes about a day to dry so Whenever you make one line, you've got to wait about a day to go back and, and fill it again. So then I started using whiteout, a whiteout pen, and that, that makes a very nice line that you can fill. But if you paint it on canvas, over time it seeps into the canvas, so your drawing will disappear. And now I used um, this stuff called slick paint, and it dries really, really fast. It doesn't disappear, it stays there, and you can fill it. It or orients you to the painting, and that's really all you need. That's all a person's eyes do whenever they're painting. hardest thing was, was colors but with oil paint the great thing about oil paints is that they're, they're all made with diff different substances and it gives them a different viscosity and a different texture the white it almost feels like caulk or toothpaste it's very it's very thick very very viscous and black is almost runny it's still it still has a thickness to it but compared to white it, it's just it's almost like oil if you were to mix half white and half black, the filling and the viscosity is somewhere halfway in between. So you can just start working from there. Sometimes I'll, I'll decide on the color just because I like the way it feels. When I first started, I painted very, very slowly. I would make a small sketch and it would take me eight hours to make one little sketch. I sped up quite a bit. And part of it is just I, I've I, I can remember a lot more, like whenever my, my hand goes over the drawing, I, I can feel the lines and then I, I remember where they are and then my other, you know, over time I've learned to, to follow it a little bit more exact. One hand sort of to see the canvas and the other hand to, to fill in the paint. It's, it's hard to tell sometimes when, when, you, when you have a lot going on in painting, if it's actually working or if the colors are very good. It's nice to have an artist that you go talk to, someone that you can talk to that you can say, you know, did, did actually, is this actually the color that I was going for? And them to be able to say yes or it is or not. You know, does, does it work? Is, is this composition? Can you can you see what I'm kind of getting at here? And and um, so the input's just invaluable. Right, it kind of like gives it like a circular, like the tracks direct the eye and then it goes down like that. Yeah. Very, I mean, you're, you're, I wouldn't even ask. Yeah, you're probably excited the clouds going off on the left. Okay, that gives you a, a sense of uh, how he does what he does. He's become very successful, by the way. I, I urge you to take a look at his uh, website. Um, he, uh, uh, he sells his paintings, he sells prints from his paintings. Uh, he you know, talks about his um, experience, and uh, um, I think you'll find it really interesting. Anyway, um, let me uh, 
go through some of the uh, details that I think are, are relevant to what we'll be talking about, which is the idea of, of um, uh, touch and how it tells us about uh, plasticity. So um, uh, he went, as you saw, as he, as he mentioned, he went blind, uh, I guess, completely blind at about 25 and had very little painting experience. He uh, uh, had done a little bit, as I said, when he was in you know, elementary and kindergarten. Um, uh, school then, but uh, uh, just his mom um, was a hobby or yeah, was a hobbyist and, and you know, that's why he said he was a little nervous when she came over uh, for the first time because she didn't know what things would look like. Um, but there you're seeing his paintings. I mean, they are certainly recognizable images. Um, some of his stuff is a little bit more abstract than others, but um, most of it, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's not like you have to decipher what he's trying to convey, which is, I think, very interesting. Um, I think his technique is fascinating. So um, what he um, does is he uses uh, something called puffy paint. And um, uh, I didn't know about this, but I guess um, this is a, a type of paint that people use sometimes to um, paint on a material uh, like, you know, uh, gene material or something like that. And what it does is it leaves uh, a raised um, line when he, he uses that. Uh, so, um, you know, he'll take the bottle and make an outline. And at first I should mention he, he, he does do this on a, a small piece of paper before he then transfers it to the, to the canvas. Um, but then once he, he does transfer the um, outline to the canvas using the puffy paint, um, he then will use that, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that it, it's coming off of the canvas to be able to feel around the outline with his left hand as he then paints in between the lines with his right hand. Um, so uh, this is something you saw him do in the, in the video. Um, he uh, uh, makes sure that uh, the, puff, the puffy paint, I guess, dries very quickly so he can do this all within a, you know, um, uh, you know, when you get you know, a painting session, you can draw the outline and then actually start filling things in. And he'll, you know, sometimes paint over the outline too, if he wants an outline that's going to be, um, you know, marking something in the painting here, right? But then he'll fill things in with his left hand. So he'll, he'll you know, I'm, yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll follow the line with the left hand and fill things in with the, the brush in his right hand. Um, uh, and, uh, one thing I think that's especially interesting about this is his use of oil paint. Um, so I have that highlighted there. Now, I'm not much of a painter or artist myself, but um, as I understand it, oil paints are not easy to use. Um, in fact, I think most people, if they're hobbyists or maybe even professionals working on canvas, much prefer acrylics um, because acrylics um, I guess they dry faster, they're less messy, they don't stink, they're cheaper. And so I think the general, you know, paint for folks is, you know, if they're going to be painting, doing paintings on canvas, um, is to use acrylic paint, not oil paint. John uses oil paint, and there's a very, very interesting reason why. And he alluded to, alluded to it in the uh, video. It's because oil paints are each made, each different... Um, uh, a hue of an oil paint is made out of different materials. So you make black oil paint from different um, things than you make white oil paint from and all the colors uh, in between. Um, each, each different shade is made with a different chemical composition. As I understand it, that's not the case for acrylics. But the fact that it is the case for oil paints allows each paint to feel different to his touch and he talked a little bit about that in the video so you know white is more like toothpaste it's a little thicker um black is more like oil it's thinner and so he can tell um uh what paint he's using partially from the way it feels on his skin um now i should mention he has a whole bunch of little tricks he uses to also determine where you know what paint he'll be using, so he lines up the paint in a very specific way um, uh, along the, the you know in front of the in front of the easel, so he knows you know maybe black is all the way to the left, white's all the way to the right. That helps him too. But what he often needs to do is mix colors. 
Um, and as he's mixing colors, he will determine how much of the various pigments are involved in a color or being added to the color by its consistency that he can touch. So it's critical that he uses uh, um, oil-based paints and not acrylics because oil has this different texture that allows him to determine the color through touch, which is pretty cool, I think. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting thing. These are tact, so I, what I wrote here is they're tactically, tactically instinct. It allows for um, paint mixing through touch, essentially, as I just uh, uh, mentioned. So he feels the, the raised lines with his non-brush hand. Um, and uh, this is how you just saw him paint. That video actually is quite old. Um, that video was, I think, I came out in 2004 five or something like that, the one that you just saw. I couldn't find another that was done well enough for you to see how he uh, actually paints that was more recent. But I can tell you that things have changed since that video. He has become better and maybe uh, more importantly, more efficient. Um, he no longer has to touch the paintings or the paint to do what he does. So um, it showed him there, and as I discussed it before, uh, him touching the raised lines with his left hand. He no longer needs to do that because what he can do is feel the raised line with his brush as he's painting different sections between those raised lines. And you can imagine, you know, how, how this might feel. Do I have anything that's like a brush around here I could use? Uh, yeah, hold on. Let me get a, here's a pen. Uh, so imagine this is the brush. Right, then, um, uh, and here's a raised line. Oh gosh, this is a, yeah. Okay, I'll do it down here. Here's a raised line on the um, on the canvas. Um, you could imagine as he's brushing up and down. If his brush touches that line, he'll be able to feel it through the brush, right? So he doesn't need to feel it with his finger. He can touch it with his brush. I mean, you you know, we, we know how to use tools, whether it's a brush or a fork or a pen. I mean, we can feel things through those tools, and that's absolutely what he does now. Um, he can determine mixtures as well of paints. He doesn't need to touch the paint, the oil paints anymore. That's a much cleaner way of of, uh, of him being able to work um, because he can get a sense of how thick the paints are by um, kind of you know pulling his brush across the mixed paint. And if it's, you know, imagine he's just mixing black and white, if it kind of is very resistant to him pulling his brush across, he'll know, oh, it's probably a little bit of a, a, a lighter shade um, because uh, the white is pastier than a darker shade. So if he like, wants to get a gray, um, he'll uh, uh, know what shade of gray it is by um, how it feels as he kind of mixes it with his brush. And, you know, the resistance of the brush will be communicated up through the, the handle of the brush to his fingers. And that's how he's able to, to do it these days. So he's become much more efficient at this whole um, uh, process. And as I said, he can also not only determine the mixture of the paint through how it resists, how uh, it resists the brush, but also the raised lines with the brush. And, and we're going to talk about this. Um, I can't remember if it's in the first touch chapter or the second touch chapter. Um, I guess it's the first. Um, which is tool use. And there's a lot of really interesting um, research on how in some cool ways our brain interprets the tools we use as a, a way of touching the world through these tools. And what I call it, I call it proxy touch, it, not a term you need to understand um, today, but something we'll be talking about in some detail later on. But it's just a, a terrific example of him having such sensitive touch that he can now touch through the brush what the paints are that he's mixing and where those little raised lines are. Um, so this is he's become much better at this. And he paints much faster, he paints much cleaner, um, he's able to bruise a lot. And he's been very productive. And we'll talk about other things he's been able to share with the world um, from this experience. Um, you know, the, he did mention very briefly in the video that sometimes based on the way um, the paint feels. Um, so you see, you will sometimes, you know, feel paint just for the kind of tactile experience, but he doesn't need to do anymore. So he is generally 
sometimes he still will feel the paint after he mixes it. He likes the way the paint feels and he'll choose a color based on that. But he'll also choose colors based on something else that's interesting. He paints from memory and from models. Okay. Um, so, you know, you can imagine that this is, in fact, this is, he talked about this particular painting when, we were, when I was interviewing him. Um, that he painted, this is his old church um, from his hometown, and he painted this completely from memory. But then this is his doggy, um, and he painted this from having the dog come up and he was touching the dog's face, and based on what he felt, he then kind of brought it to the canvas and did it that way. Um, this is his brother that you're seeing down here. Um, same type of thing. Now, this is interesting, I think. This kind of makes it not just you know, him producing art, but him producing art in a, an especially unique and creative way. Because what he will often do is choose color based on not the color that might be in the real world that one would see, but how the color feels on the model and in the paint. What do I mean by that? It kind of sounds a little spacey, but it's not. It's very, very concrete. He will touch somebody's face here, for example, and think this part of the skin is a little oily. Okay? We have a lot of oil down here often. Okay? More probably up here than we do over here, for example. All right. Let's see. On my brother, when I touched his face there, it reminded me of how blue feels when I touch blue, okay? because that blue just happens to have, you know, a chemical composition. Oil paint happens to have a chemical composition that just happens to have, you know, the same type of feel as this part of his brother's face. Now, I'm colorblind. I don't think this is, is this green. I don't know. I don't know. But you get the idea. He would then choose that color to represent that part of his face just because they felt the same to his skin as they were as he was touching them, okay? which is really interesting. He, you know, he kind of, you know, kind of released the constraints of having to represent everything color wise exactly how it should be out in the world and instead choose colors based on how the skin feels and how the oil paint that particular oil paint feels. It's kind of an interesting way of going about it. It makes his kind of manner of painting kind of unique. And the other thing he says is it, he believes that um, it, it actually, when you're required to touch the thing you're going to be painting, it allows you to actually get more detail. Um, and that's absolutely the case when he's touching his dog's face and he's touching his friend's or his brother's face in that case. And, you know, it, it allows you to, to kind of represent detail that maybe you'd miss by just looking at it which I think is kind of interesting. And so he, he truly believes this, um, which has led him to do some teaching. Um, and so, yeah, John um, has taught painting both to blind and sighted um, uh, classrooms. Uh, so he, I, I, if you go on his website, there are a couple of videos of him teaching um, at a blind school um, and you know, with the kids there uh, and telling them how he does things. And then, you know, the parents sometimes would be there too, and he'd be teaching the parents. But um, there are also instances where he has been brought in by, you know, like top-notch art schools, you know, California School for the Arts or something like that, um, where there'd be painters there, illustrators there, um, to listen to how he goes about his process. And he does something interesting he told me about. What he does is he takes an apple, you know, real apple, good healthy apple, puts it in the middle of the room, uh, maybe on a stool, and asks everybody to quickly draw it, draw the apple. And everybody does, you know, people have all probably drawn apples before if they've been in art school for a while, not a problem. And then he says, okay, everybody show each other your little drawing of, your, of the apple. And everybody shows their apples to everybody else. And they said, yeah, these are apples. And they kind of all look like apples and they kind of all look the same say like, okay now what i'd like you to do is to close your eyes and i'm going to pass the apple around and i want you to feel the apple and feel it in its detail okay and then you know give yourself a good minute 
full minute to feel it. Okay. Here's my apple. And you can imagine, you know, like apples aren't as complex as this in terms of their texture, but they can be very complex. You know, they have indentations in certain places. They have, you know, parts that are smoother than other places, parts that are a little bit more oily than other places, parts that feel dry, parts that feel a little more moist. Maybe they can, you can press in in certain areas and not others. Um, the texture of the, the stem versus the texture of the, the skin, all that sort of stuff. And you do that, you get a lot of information, even in a minute, you pass it then to your next classmate, and then open your eyes and paint the apple. And what he shows is that after he goes through that and everybody in the classroom has a chance to touch the apple for a minute and then paint the apple that they felt for five minutes, they then show everybody in the classroom the paintings and they're all different. They're all very different. You know, some people, um, you know, maybe concentrated on the the skin's oiliness and another person might have concentrated on the, the um, you know, kind of indentations that they felt but didn't, didn't really notice when they looked at it. So all the apples look very different, very unique, very individual. And he really makes this kind of interesting argument that, that uh, visual art, what we usually call visual art painting, is something that can be apprehended and actually created through touch as well as through sight, which I think, which I think is really interesting. And I think he makes an even more, um, I think, um, compelling argument for that and something else he's done. So let, let's talk about the artwork you're seeing here. And maybe some of you have known this. Um, these are these are John's works right here. This is his wife. Um, and this is uh, is one of his uh, old neighborhoods uh, that he did from uh, memory. But these are not John's works. These are from famous painters, very famous painters. Uh, this is a Cezanne. This is a Rembrandt. And probably a lot of you know that this is a Van Gogh. Okay. Um, and John has been invited to touch these paintings by the collectors, sometimes by the museums. Now, you've been to museums enough, to probably probably enough to know that you're not supposed to touch the paintings, right? That's uh, that, 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 for very good reasons, especially the old paintings. Um, you know, the skin, uh, the oil on our skin can be very damaging to the oil on the canvas. Um, you know, it can absolutely um, facilitate their their degrading, and so do not touch paintings. John, on the other hand, has been asked to put on rubber gloves to, to, so that doesn't happen, and to touch these paintings as they are described to him um, for sometimes five, 10 minutes at a shot. Okay, so he's touched the, the paintings of Cezanne, Rembrandt, and uh, Van Gogh. And um, he said it's a really interesting experience, especially since now that he's become an artist, he's read a lot about these painters. Um, and knows something about their personalities, knows something about their techniques, knows something about their history. And so he says that when he feels, especially with these all old styles of using oil paint and everything, when you feel a painting, you do feel the textures of the dried paint, right? You can feel, you know, the, the, the dried um, paint that was created by different brush strokes. And different painters have a different style and a different kind of a different way of moving the brush across the canvas. And so when he's touching the painting, he's kind of getting a closer connection to what the painter was doing as they were actually painting the picture. Okay. Um, you know, you could imagine here that um, maybe these brush strokes are a little bit more splotchy, okay? Um, these might be a little smoother because, you know, Rembrandt's trying to really depict the, the shadings of light to dark here and, and, you know, lighting sources and stuff like that. But look at Van Gogh. I mean, you can see how Van Gogh painted these, right? I mean, clearly these were pretty, I don't know, what would you say, aggressive brush strokes? Um, they look it, and I'm sure they feel it. And so what John says is when he feels these paintings of other people, he kind of 
has a sense of what was what the artist was going through as they were creating the painting. Not only the techniques they were using, but possibly the different emotions. You know, the emotion kind of in some ways might affect you know the technique and in some ways the technique might affect the emotion i imagine this is a hard technique to use and feel relaxed with right that like that where this probably takes a lot of concentration um you know to get all these lines and all these um, um you know kind of shadings of different color and light here so this must be that might be a more relaxed state that the artist is in and so, you know, he, he feels the technique and beyond that, maybe something about the emotion the artist was going through as they were making the painting. And that's not something we would necessarily think about as we just looked at these paintings. Maybe now you will, that's kind of cool. But to have that close contact with the, the painterly act, right? The act of actually making the painting and then possibly inferring from that what the psychological state might have been of the painter because of the technique here they were using either either you know the the emotion affected the technique but the technique you could imagine might make somebody more tense or relaxed depending on what they were doing but he believes he has insight to that and it kind of makes an interesting argument for you know art and art appreciation being something that one could gain not just through sight, but through touching as well, which I think is, is a kind of really interesting way of, of thinking about art. And John Bramble, its uh, experience and, and uh, history has kind of helped us understand that, which is very cool. Okay, that's the story of John Bramble. It's a fun way to get into it, interesting way to get into it, I think. But I think we need to understand a little bit more about um, some of the science behind what John can do, because clearly John has learned over time, especially to improve his sense of touch in order to do what he's able to do. You know, being able to use the brush and determining, you know, the mixture of paint and where the ridges are, and just being able to, you know, refine his sense of touch so he can potentially tell what colors are involved with a mixture if he's, if he's going to um, touch the paint directly, which he sometimes does. So, oh, that's in there that's from another class um let's talk a little bit about blindness and touch okay um so we do know this um that uh when a person loses their sight um either early or even at the age john uh, lost his sight that their sense of touch is actually kept um at um a, a heightened level into old age. So they do have greater touch sensitivity. And I, I should mention how this is done. Um, well, I have another slide that has one of, a picture of one of these little devices. Um, I don't know if you've ever, and probably, probably you're young, so they don't use them on, on young people very much, but certainly as people get older, they start using them because as, as people get older, you know, we start losing our sense of touch a little bit. Oh, look what I got, okay. I'm glad I'm in the office here because I can make a little touch sensitive apparatus for you. Okay, here we go. I'm going to make it out of paper clips. And I realized to do this right, I've got to do it in front of work. Okay. So it would be something like this. Okay, all right, two paper clips. All right, so you see there's two paper clips here, right? All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have these two paper clips there, the tips very close together. And then I'm going to put it on somebody's skin. And uh, they're going to have their eyes closed. They'll be blindfolded or something. And their job would be to say, is this, I'm trying to get this as close as Is this, are you being touched by a single point or multiple points? Okay, so you do that. I'll say single point. Okay, let's do it again. And what they do is they slowly pull these points apart. Single point or multiple points. We're well, gonna have a nice video of this. Okay. Okay, now I can feel this is two points, but by the time I get into my 80s, okay, I probably won't. 
And that's what happened then when people get into older age. They lose their touch sensitivity. I have already lost some. I mean, I, you know, when you start losing it, I think when you're in your 40s, but it doesn't really become noticeable until you're, you're much older generally. Um, by the way, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the reason, they think a lot of the reason why um, older people have falls, they lose their sense of balance, is because they don't have the same sensitivity on the bottom of their feet that they used to. So they have trouble, you know, using that kind of, that touch information on the bottom of their feet to help them balance. Okay. Um, but, you know, if I were in my 80s, um, I might not feel that this is far enough. I might need something like this and say, oh yeah, now I feel two points. I think that's probably exaggerated. It probably anybody, you know, could feel that, and, you know, maybe even a little closer, but you get the idea. That's how that's done. And if you want to buy this device, it's, it's a uh, hundred dollars. Um, but here's the thing, we all lose our touch sensitivity, but the blind are known to have touch sensitivity that maintains its, its, its heightened abilities uh, for some time. In fact, it, it counteracts the age decline by almost 25 years. So um, when I'm 75, um, I'm not going to have the best touch sensitivity, but a person who has been blind most of their life or a good chunk of their life, um, when they're 75, they will have the touch sensitivity of what my touch sensitivity was like when I was 50. Okay. Um, so it, it is really you know, impressive in the sense that, you know, um, it kind of gives you a, a heightened sensitivity that kind of is 25 years younger in a way, which is kind of interesting. Um, and why is this the case? Why do people who are blind have a heightened touch sensitivity? And you can see this image down here that at least one possible answer is that, you know, um, people who are blind, I mean, they use Braille. And so maybe that experience with Braille has helped their touch sensitivity. So that is a possibility, okay, because they use Braille. But I mean, that's what I always thought before I started getting into this literature. But what I didn't know until I started reading this is something interesting. Probably less than 10% of blind people actually know Braille. So, you know, there's Braille all over the campus, right? Um, um, in my office here, I have a little sign that says exit route um, uh, uh, right next to my door. Uh, you know, remember the signs all over the, the buildings on campus. Um, they all have a Braille translation of what's said in the sign underneath it. And that's very useful for those uh, folks on campus who use Braille. And probably the probably a lot of the blind, I mean, in all fairness, a lot of the blind people on campus do use Braille. But it, in terms of the number of blind people, uh, even in the country, um, a lot of them sadly don't go to college. And a lot of them sadly, um, you know, don't have the sort of uh, living situation where they would need to learn to read Braille, to use the sense of touch to, to read. And that's even tr more true now where any sort of text can be translated into, um, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, spoken um, uh, uh, sound, right? Whether it's Siri kind of, you know, I could, right now I could take the text here on my PowerPoint and have, uh, I guess it's Siri on my Mac, Siri's on my Mac, right? Uh, say this, I mean, it would be, it would take probably less than two minutes to set that up. So in a lot of ways, if one's blind, they don't, they don't need to be able to use text, any, any sort of text anywhere, whether it's on computer, it's on, um, uh, you know, uh, from a, um, a book, it can, you can get an audio version of it, either get your computer, do it or have somebody read it. If any of you have my book on audio version, that's my little voice on there. So that's a way that the Braille can use my book and, and I'm sorry, the blind can use the book and that's, uh, and some people have. Um, okay, so why do they have this increased sense of touch if in fact most blind people don't? And this is where we'll start talking about this idea of plasticity, something called cross modal or cross sensory plasticity. And yes, we did talk about this briefly when we talked about uh, Daniel Kish. We talked about the fact that he uses his um, unused visual brain areas, visual 
cortex for those of you who like to keep track of these things back here okay to um uh for dan hit here better and also for dan and, and many blind people to touch better so what happens because this region is no longer uh, this region is no longer getting input from sight it can be used for other things including hearing and very often touch most blind individuals use it for both but touch seems to play like it seems to get a big boost from back here okay the visual area all right okay so that's what we're talking about this is a, a change in a brain area to accommodate um uh, another sense that it I guess wasn't originally designed for didn't isn't originally being used for okay so what happens well when we touch something now I can do this yeah this is nice I got my brain here I'm so happy when we touch something you and me not blind or if, if any of you have a visual impairment uh, of course this would uh, 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 wouldn't apply to you, but um, whenever you, this is true of, of uh, blind folks as well. When anybody touches something, whether blind or sighted, whether um, good vision or poor vision, they um, make use of this little line here. Wait, is it? Uh, yeah, it's the one back here. I think this is it. Yeah. Um, this, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. This is one of these situations where my color blind is. Is this blue or pink or purple this blue type of shade here whatever this is you see where my goes down here all right that's it goes all the way around it's on the other side too if you're interested but yeah this is a part of the brain that responds to touch and you're seeing it right here okay oh it's blue thanks carla <laughs> uh this is a part of the the brain that responds to touch i don't know what color it is here i don't care um, but that's what happens. And, and in fact, there's a little map there. We're going to talk about this map as we really get into plasticity in detail. So now what we're doing is we're um, uh, taking that little blue part and turning it around. And now you're seeing this blue part mapped from the front. And you can see that different parts of the body are mapped to different regions. So, okay. Let's do this is kind of fun since we have the brain. So what's down here? It looks down like down here is the throat. Remember, you're looking at it from the front. So right down here is the throat, and then the tongue uh, goes up. Uh, we go as we go up, we get to the lips and face, um, and uh, then the hand is up here until we get to the top up here. And there's the trunk. Oh, and look, Gosh, I'm showing off with my brain now. So rarely use it. I rarely use my brain. Now we can open up the brain. Okay, we looked at this side. We opened up the brain, and now as we go down here, we're uh, to the leg, feet, toes, uh, genitalia. Okay, so that's what we got, and that's cool because we have a map. So you touch me on the um, th uh, throat down here. You touch me down here. This little piece down here. Oops, oh, shoot, sorry. This little piece down here is going to light up. Uh, you touch me on my um, leg, okay, you touch me on my leg, this little piece up here will light up, right up here. Okay, you get the idea. Now, you've probably seen these things before in psychology books or biology books. Um, I've always loved these pictures. I think they're so silly. What this represents is how much a different part of the strip here is dedicated to which body part, okay? Um, and that's why it looks so silly. So all this is saying is a lot of that little map there is, in fact, dedicated to the hands, which is functionally sensible, right? You know, it's important for us to have a lot of, a lot of good touch sensitivity on our hands, much more than on our leg or something like that, for that matter, right? So we do. We, we devote a lot of brain region to the, our sense of touch on our hands, more so than we do to our thigh, despite the fact that our thighs are bigger than our hands, right? So this is just representing how much of this brain region is devoted to that body region. You can see there's a lot of brain region here. This, look at how much is devoted to tongue and throat and jaw and lips, 
all that's being represented by this silly map. Same with there's a lot on our ears and you know, relatively little. Look at what our, our legs, our skin and our legs are not, not particularly sensitive. It's the hands and lips and, you know, around the face that's very. Okay. So when we touch something, when we touch, say, keys or something like that, we are setting off activity there. And in this case, it would be since we're touching with our hands, we're setting off activity uh, right here. Okay. When the blind touch something, they do set off that strip, that little area right there that I just pointed out, but they also set off areas in their visual regions, the regions that are in the back of the brain, as we've been discussing. There is that cross sensory, cross modal and cross sensory is the same thing. Cross modal, we modes of senses. That's what, that's why some call it, sometimes called cross modal. Um, but uh, yeah, cross sensory plasticity is now going to take advantage of this unused part to help the blind touch better. Okay. So that's what happens when a blind person touches something. They don't only make use of that strip, they also make use of that area in back. Okay. And we've known this for a long time, actually. We've known this through um, uh, long before we had, um, uh, you know, fMRIs to look at brain activity as people did different tasks. Um, we wouldn't like there, there's uh, um, stories, there's case studies uh, written about about a, a woman who a blind woman who um, uh, was a, a long term Braille user. She you know, was blind from birth and she started using Braille as soon as um, you know, she would have normally have started reading, which is what first grade or whatever. And she used Braille all of her life. You know, she was a very, very um, uh, good, efficient Braille reader. Um, but then when she got quite old, she uh, had a stroke and she had a stroke in the visual region of her brain back here. Right. And when that happened, um, she lost the ability to use Braille, even though she was still able to use her sense of touch for other things. So she could no longer touch Braille and really understand what the bump said. You know what Braille looks like. You can all look at it right here. Right. It's a, a kind of collection. Each letter is represented by, um, I believe, uh, 12 uh, dots, um, uh, wait, is it 12 or six? I can't, yeah, six dots um, that are uh, lined up, three lined up next to each other vertically. Um, and some of them are poked out and some of them are poked in and they each represent letter. She could no longer use it, even though she had been doing it all her life, because she had damage to this area, just a, a stroke damage to this area of her brain. The other part that touches, though, this part here, was spared. It wasn't affected by the stroke. So she could feel things pretty well. I mean, she could certainly, you know, you put a, a knife or fork into her hand, she could tell you in a second what it was, you put keys into her hand, you put different shapes into her hand. So yeah, I can tell this, this is no problem. The thing that seems to be affected here from my stroke is my use of Braille, which is interesting. It suggests that not only is the visual area used for touch, but it more precisely is used for a certain type of touch. Maybe a certain type of touch that involves spatial precision or something like that, which is really interesting. Okay, so we knew that for a long time. This was before MRI and other sorts of uh, techniques. Um, but I want to talk about one of these new techniques. Um, it's probably about, well, I don't know how long it's been used for research, maybe 20 years, I would say. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's proven to be really, really important. It's a technique that essentially creates a temporary brain lesion. So you might know that um, a lot of early research um, in understanding the brain was done by uh, 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 looking at stroke patients. So people would have um, uh, damage in a particular area of the brain and they would have some deficit, um, perceptual deficit maybe, motor deficit, language deficit, right? Language is the most common one. Um, maybe you know somebody who's had a stroke and then had a difficult time um, speaking for a while. Like often they're able to kind of compensate and come back to it. Um, but uh, yeah, and that would be, you know, if you're interested, that would be damage in, 
in uh, Broca's area, um, which is a language area, very close to the um, a speech perception area too. So that's how we used to know things. Um, now we can use MRI to see where things light up, but maybe even more importantly, we can temporarily lesion the brain. What I mean by lesion here is actually stop it from working or I guess stall it for a very temporary and subtle, in a temporary and subtle way and see how that affects, affects behavior, right? It's one thing to ask somebody to do something and watch how the brain lights up. It's another thing to be able to kind of stop a specific region from working and see how that affects how the person is perceiving, how the person is acting, that sort of thing. It's an amazing sort of tool for scientists. It's, it's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. You know, you have to kind of remember that term. I'm not going to, you know, you're not going to be tested on whether it, it's got the right spelling or not, um, but you have to understand what it does. Um, you're seeing it right here. And it's nice because it, it, it really isn't as kind of technically um, involved as MRI. Um, you need much less space for it. So we have an MRI on campus. I don't know if you're aware of that. Actually, we have, probably have a few now that we have this med school, but we have one right out here. I'm in the psychology building right here. And in a small building right next door, that's kind of adjacent to the lot six, that building there, it has an MRI and it has a single MRI and it has a huge, the, the MRI is this gigantic device that, you know, kind of takes up an entire room, not, you know, a large room. Okay. This, on the other hand, this transcranial magnetic stimulation device is something you could have in a walk-in closet. Um, this is like something you might see in the dentist. You know how when you go to the dentist, um, they take x-rays and they kind of move this big thing around you to take x-rays on different sides of your mouth. It's pretty much like that. Okay. Um, and so what you're seeing here is this being applied to the back of the brain. You just, you know, you put it outside the brain and outside the skull and you turn it on. And essentially what it does is it turns off that region of the brain for a brief amount of time and it doesn't completely shut it off it kind of almost mixes it up but it affects it enough so you'll see changes in um you know what uh, a person experiences okay so um just as an example say you do remember we talked about the part in the back this visual area here this is for a sighted person if you turned it on if you put it in the back of the brain, which is what they're doing here, and turn it on, if it were you, me, a sighted person, um, you might not see things very well for a short period of time. Things might kind of look like they're blurred out, or I don't know if you've ever had like a snow blindness, if you've been skiing and, and you know, you kind of come in and you, get, you just see kind of like these white blobs for a while. It happens, to, uh, that used to happen to me when I, when I was a kid, because I grew up in snow, snow land, upstate New York. And I come in from a day out in the snow and for a while there, you know, I just see nothing but kind of white. It's kind of, a, uh, there's a lot of re reasons for that, but that's what it's like. If we were to do this right now, that's what it would be like. Um, but it would only last a few seconds, depending on how long the thing was on. Maybe after we turned off the device, um, it would continue to affect you in some way, uh, but only for a matter of minutes at the most, and then you'd be fine. Then it would go back to normal. Okay, so that's what would happen to a sighted person if we put it back there. Okay, um, so essentially, transcranial magnetic stimulation (TMS) as we'll abbreviate a lot creates this transient lesion. It just basically messes with or temporarily breaks a part of the brain. It sounds much more severe than it actually is. I hate to say it. I'm just trying to make you understand what it's going to do. It's going to stop the working of a part of the brain um, subtly and briefly. You, you might know um, uh, that um, TMS is actually used for therapeutic, pur therapeutic purposes. So it's been used to treat um, uh, tinnitus, which is the, the problem of having ringing in your ear. Um, I know a lot of, you know, 
folks in music and a lot of you know rock stars that have this it's you know it's it's a real hazard so we all we all wear hearing protection now but it is a it is something that does happen for folks that have especially when they were young didn't have ear protection um, it is now fairly successfully treated with using TMS. Um, also, it's been used to treat depression to some degree, I believe, with some success. So I don't want you to think that this is an evil machine that breaks the brain. It can be used for a lot of purposes, and any sort of disruption that occurs is brief and subtle. I've you know, been in these things, and I'm fine as far as I know. Okay, so if we use this device now to see if we can kind of uh, replicate this effect we talked about before of, uh, uh, you know, that was induced by a real stroke based brain lesion. Let's see if, if that will happen. And so what we can do is this. We can take our little TMS device, swing the, the little thing around so it's no longer, here's my TMS device. This is where the picture is showing. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swing it around so it's over that little strip, that little touch strip that we've been talking about. Okay, right over there. If you then turn it on, what happens is that a, a blind person and a, side per, a sighted person will no longer be able to discriminate shapes or identify shapes that are put into their hands. Okay, so these are, you know, if they're sighted people, they are, um, uh, they're blindfolded. Um, but imagine now I've had my, the TMS is now working on my brain and somebody puts this curved object, it's a little bell for a doggy, uh, it puts this curved object in my hand, and I'll say, I don't know if that's a triangle or a square or a rectangle, or then this, which is a rectangular thing, is put in my hand, and I say, I'm sorry, I can feel there's something in my hand, but I don't know what shape it is. Okay, and then we move the thing back, turn it off, and put things into their hand, and they're fine again, just to relieve any sort of concern you might have for the patients. This is a temporary sort of effect. Cool. Whether you're blind or sighted, that's, that's how um, using TMS on that touch strip of your brain is uh, going to affect it. However, if we now swing it around and use it on the visual area as that picture is showing, okay, we swing it from the touch area and bring it back here now, and now apply it to the visual area, what you find is they now are able to touch um, a shape and determine what it is, okay? But they lose their ability for fine touch, okay? They would not be able to, say, discriminate between things like a brow pattern. So, and, you know, you don't even really, I mean, this is something we all could do. Um, you, you don't need to be able to, you know, effectively read Braille in order to be able to discriminate, you know, um, a pattern of, say, you know, look at these closely. Um, you're, you'd be able to touch this and, and say, there, here's three dots, here's five dots, that sort of thing. Okay, you'd be able to do that right now. You wouldn't know what they represent because you haven't learned to read Braille, but you're, you're, you can do this. You're, you can, you know, you, your skin is sensitive enough, especially at your age, to be able to do this. But you would not be able to do it, and the blind would not be able, well, the, the blind would lose their ability to be able to do this if, in fact, their visual cortex was affected. So I'm really, I, I misspoke. This is really applying to the blind now they would lose their fine sense of touch, which means that any sort of advantage they have over non-blind people, which includes this 25 year offset of, of touch decline, is probably based on their involvement of the visual brain area, which is especially going to help them with their fine sense of touch. So the advantage the blind had on this test, right? The test of one point versus two points would disappear. That advantage would disappear if, in fact, we were using TMS on their visual areas, okay, on the visual cortex. All right, cool. 
let's go on and talk about this. Oh, and oh, this is a nice way to this is a nice way to to end our discussion today. I'm not going to talk about. Uh, remember, we we just discussed this a little bit um, that uh, uh, things can happen not only with blindness but with temporary blindness. And so now I'm going to talk about a very famous experiment that involves bringing sighted people into uh, I, I think it's you often a, a hospital room and have them blindfolded for five days. Now we just talked about this a little bit because we were discussing how one of the kind of um, anecdotes about this is that, you know, uh, they, they kind of lose their sense of flavor for a, the time that they're blindfolded. It's one of the first things they notice. Um, and sometimes it starts to come back by the fifth day, but, but um, that's one of the things that all these subjects and these experiments complain about is their sense of taste. But this does, we're no longer talking about taste, we're talking about touch here. This is how it works. Okay, so you'll have five days of visual deprivation. Um, and um, you're gonna be tested um, through these five days. And this, this is serious visual deprivation, by the way, you can see here. Um, this is a serious blindfold. Uh, uh, cotton patches are put over the eyes, then eight, then ace bandages are wrapped around the, the eyes. So there's no light vision at all. Probably most blindfolds you've worn, you could see a little light over uh, uh, through on the side or something like that. These are really serious blindfolds. So they're getting no light vision at all. And so these subjects have five days of, of visual deprivation. The first thing that they're going to do after they've been blindfolded is, is go into an MRI, fMRI machine. Okay. And they're going to be scanned as they um, uh, touch a, a pattern of dots that is like Braille. It's not exactly Braille, but for all intents and purposes, let's say we can imagine it is just like Braille. None of these subjects, by the way, know Braille. Okay, you know, they, they've seen it around campus, but they've never really even touched it for the purposes of, of any, you know, anything uh, to try to understand what it meant or anything like that. Um, but we're gonna look to see what their brains are doing as they touch, right? That happens as soon as they're blindfolded, okay, as soon as they're blindfolded, okay. Then starting after that quick test, they are going to go through some pretty intensive training. They are gonna have six hours of actual Braille lessons per day for each of the five days. That's a lot. Well, you're not doing much else and you're getting paid a lot of money. Okay, so it's not too bad. Um, why not go through uh, that many uh, hours? You know, you're just beats not doing anything, right? Um, so you do your best. You get paid a lot of money, so please do your best. You try six hours a day to try to under, like feel the differences in the different letters of Braille and then be able to maybe make out some words after a little while, maybe some sentences after the third or fourth day. You know, you're trying your best, so you're going you're gonna to do that. Okay. Um, after each six-hour um, lesson, subjects are going to be tested again for their discrimination of these dots. Okay, and in, in this task, I should say, it's a raised dot, so how many dots do you feel? That's it, how many dots do you feel? Let's, tell, let's say that, let's just call it that task. Okay. So yes, they have been trained with Braille, but when they're being scanned, they're not asked to you know, say what this word is in Braille, but just how many dots do you feel? And the question is what's going on in their brain as they do that. Okay, that's the next thing. All right. And then finally, there's one other. So this happens. The MRI, the, the test of discrimination, happens after each six-hour period, including that of the last day. Okay. One last thing I need to tell you is this: um, uh, on the last day, when we ask you to do this discrimination of dots, um, we're going to use our new best friend, transcranial magnetic stimulation (TMS). And we're going to use that to see if any advantage that you've uh, uh, gained over those five days can be temporarily broken. And by determining which areas we can um, turn off to create that disruption can tell us something about how five days of blindness might affect plasticity. That's what we're interested in here. We already know a lot about the plasticity in the blind. Can blind, five days of blindness do the same type of thing? OK. 
Okay. Here's what we learned. When you first started the experiment and you were touching those dots for, you know, to determine how many there were, you just used, based on the fMRI, you just used the strip. But this, after that, when you went back to your hospital room and got your six hour braille lesson, and then came back and touched the dots. In fact, the discrimination, okay, um, did start making use of your visual brain area, the, the part on the back of your head. Okay. So just the first six hour training session, it's the fact that you're not getting any sight and you're being trained seemed to start involving that visual region. And that involvement increases over the five days. Okay, I said after your six hour session, every single day you're getting your MRI, you see the visual area of your brain getting more and more involved every day. Okay, it increases okay, over the five days. Now, there's something I didn't tell you, and that is there's another group of subjects, and guess what they got to do? They got to do the Braille training, but they didn't have to be blindfolded. They got all the MRI and all that. Um, so they, had, they were in the hospital too. Um, they had their own room, but they were not blindfolded. They could watch TV. I guess you could listen to TV and you know, stuff like that, but um, they had their sight available to them the entire time. Okay. The question is, was the fact that you were blindfolded increase the involvement of that visual area in performing that task? And yeah, the answer is yes. So even if you've had six hours of Braille training, okay, you're not going to have much visual area involvement if you're getting regular vision input. It seems that being blindfolded is going to be necessary for at least some of this uh, visual brain areas involvement in touch. Okay, but guess what else? There's one more group. This group doesn't sound terrible to be in. They're blindfolded, but they don't have their six hours of training every day. They don't have that six hour. They do something more fun, I guess. They're not touching things. They're just blindfolded. The question is, when they are asked to make those discriminations, are they involving the visual regions of their brain? And the answer is, yeah. In fact, their visual regions, and in fact, their performance on that touch task is as pronounced as yours, even though you had the six hours of training. You don't need six hours of training to involve your visual brain area. You just need to have visual deprivation. You have to be blind for those five days, which is really, really interesting. It seems that, yeah, maybe Braille helps a little bit in the touch discrimination, but what really helps is involvement of the visual brain and what gets that going is being blindfolded, okay? which is interesting. Okay. And remember one more thing we needed to say is the use of TMS. Okay. When TMS is used on that last day on the visual area, okay, it reduces your ability to discriminate the dots. Any sort of an advantage that you had over the course of five days in discrimination disappears if the visual region of your brain is TMS, is basically broke for that way for that time being. So what we want to say, let's just finish with this. Visual deprivation from this experiment, it says visual deprivation allows your visual brain to enhance your touch discrimination. It's the visual deprivation that's important. Yes, Braille might help a little bit, the Braille, six hours of Braille training, but look at this. Okay, it was equal to those subjects that didn't get the training and were just blindfolded. Visual deprivation is what's key here. Okay, we'll talk uh, more about this on uh, Tuesday. Good luck on your exam, everybody. Um, and don't forget, you know, all this touch stuff will be on your final, not on the midterm. All right.
Good luck.